The views, comments, stories, and opinions shared within this podcast are our own or those of our guests and in no way represent the views of the companies, associations, or organizations that any of us may work for or represent. All stories, events, and tales shared within this episode may or may not have happened in the manner in which they were told. They may or may not have even happened at all. The details have been changed to protect the innocent and the guilty alike. This is Squawk Ident. You're listening to Squawk Ident, an aviation podcast that explores the many pathways to an aviation profession, the challenges that a professional aviator can expect in today's marketplace, and we share many stories along the way. I'm your host, Aviator Tony, a professional airline pilot currently flying for a U.S. legacy airline with over 20 years on the flight line. Welcome aboard Flight 147 of the Squawk Ident podcast, recorded on the 23rd of August, 2024, from the Aviator Sound Studios from somewhere in Southern California. On today's flight, I'll be joined by Roger, Alex, and Terry. Together, we will discuss the current state of the aviation industry. We will talk about pilot resumes and the best practices to transition from flight instructor to a 121 pilot. We also have the privilege of speaking with Captain Keith Wolzinger. The first time Keith was on the program was on Flight 111, the Long Haul Rhythm where we first had the opportunity to learn about his aviation journey. He also joined us on flight 139, airline retirement, where he discussed his aviation retirement experience. It's been a year since his retirement and his aviation career is still soaring. Today we'll discover how the aviation bug has kept him flying professionally. So stick with us as we discuss all this and more on the 147th episode of the Squawk Island Podcast. Joining me today is an exceptional aviator and co-host. He is a professional CFI, I, and MEI flight instructor, a former Embraer 145 airline pilot, King Air instructor, Falcon 900EZ2000, and Gulfstream 650 commander. Currently, he operates a Gulfstream 650 for a Fortune 500 corporation in the United States of America. He joins us fresh off fax training and canceled flights. Joining us from somewhere in San Diego, California, please help me in welcoming to the show, Captain Roger. Roger, how you doing? Doing all right, Tony. How are you? <laughs> Got a little distracted there, right at the uh, right at the intro. There, sorry. Is that, is yeah, that doing you, well. Is that what you do also when you're uh, when you're flying the airplane and they're like, Captain, Captain, Captain? Right? Huh? <laughs> what? Where are we? <laughs> so, how you doing, man? I'm doing all right. It's um, actually been fairly slow for me for the past four weeks or so. So I'm. I'm yeah. feeling pretty. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling very rested. I haven't left the country in four weeks. You know, it's nice. A little different. So no, no wackle issues. No, uh, no wackle issues. issues. Yeah. Well, nothing work related, at least. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, good. Um, you know, I I pretty much have had this month off as well. Um, it's funny that you say that you haven't been flying much. I know we've we've gone back and forth over the phone a few times but yeah i I had a trip to italy as i discussed on my last uh episode there uh, where we talked about you know the walkle and flying fatigued and all that kind of stuff um not that we condone flying fatigue just saying being fatigued because of your flight schedule and uh, in this case it was because of a vacation schedule and so coming back i was you know I, i got a little bit of a head cold and so i had to bang out sick for a trip and and then after that, uh, I, I think I flew one sequence and then I had a string of days off. So I ended up uh, taking a little vacation to the center of the country there in Iowa. Um, did a couple of days there. And of course, uh, being on a farm did not bode well with my allergies. I tried to be a, a ranch hand for uh, 24 hours and you know got into this suburban kid got into uh slopping pigs and uh feeding the chickens and the turkeys and uh uh you know just taking care of a horse and learned a lot had a good time uh 24 learned not hour- to do it again yeah 24 hours later uh i was in urgent care <laughs> and the uh, and the allergist that saw me was like man you you know you're no virus no major issues but yeah, you you really were affected, you know, all this dust out here. So, so they put me on some medication, and uh, they said, "Yeah, you you can fly home. You're fine." So, okay, 
flew home, had a little bit of an inner ear block, which was uncomfortable. Anyone that has inner ear block after a flight knows how that could be painful and dangerous, especially for pilots. So you got to be careful. Uh, luckily, I had all the medication and the tools that I needed, uh, the eardrops and all that. Um, so yeah, got home and just rested. And then I was ready to go back to work a couple days later. I, I felt pretty good. But then I got a uh, summons, uh, jury duty. So I went for my jury duty obligation, which, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, they fight to get out of it. They go and they're like, ah, oh, I can't, I can't be here financially. It's going to, or I have kids or I got to watch my dog or whatever. Um, I've, I used to be like that when I was younger. I was like, oh, I don't want to be here, you know, but, um, after my experience that, you know, I, I even talked about it on the show a little bit, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it was a pretty, pretty positive experience to go through that and serve my community by being a juror. So I really went in going, well, hey, uh, now that I know that the company pays you, uh, your whatever trip you were doing, they'll take you off of it and they pay you to sit on a jury. So I thought, well, if they pick me, they pick me. If they don't, they don't. So, well, they pick me. Day one, they go, oh, you fly for uh, Legacy Airlines? Uh, they pay you f indefinitely. I can keep you for months if I want to. Okay, you have been selected. You're on panel A. This case will go four to five weeks. What? I mean, that's that's a bit excessive, but it was a pretty pretty big case, um, and it's still ongoing, so I'm not going to talk about the details, but uh, I was there two weeks, uh, basically four days of uh, voir dire, which is where they ask the judge, ask each juror questions, um, you know, are you, what's your background? Do you have any experience? Uh, do you have any people in law enforcement in your family or friends? Do you have you or anyone you know or family been convicted of a crime, been a victim of a crime? Uh, do you have any issues with this? Do you have any issues with that? They're trying to understand the jury. And this is a process that is not like SVU or CSI. It's just not like that. So, um, it, it just, it was one of those things where it's just a slow, slow paced, can't sit there in the jury room being on your phone, playing angry birds. You just can't, you just, you have to pay attention that the, the bailiff will <laughs> quickly correct you if you do that kind of stuff. But I went the, you know, to the point where I was going to be an alternate juror and then the defense attorney excused me. So yeah, we would like to thank and excuse juror number whatever I was. Um, and judge, if the judge has no objections, that's it. You go, you serve your time, you listen to this wadir process. And, and I did not get selected to be a juror on that, uh, trial. However, who are all the people that were selected? Um, uh, they have to sit there for another probably two or three weeks, uh, to be a part of this jury trial, criminal trial. So I did my service. I did my time. And, and every day I had to submit paperwork uh, to the company via our electronic flight bag. I had to fill out a form with a picture evidence that they gave me a slip every day that, yes, you were in fact in the jury room. Um, and so that's what I've been doing. I have, I have not flown now since the beginning of the month, so about 21 days of not flying. Um, but now I got a trip on Sunday, so I'm excited to get back to it. Um, doesn't matter how many years you are with the company or with aviation, when you don't fly for a few weeks, it's always a little unnerving to go back to work because you're like, do I remember what to do? Am I going to remember? Is it, is it like riding a bike? Or should I study? <laughs> so that's, I mean, and you, you guys could probably attest to this a little bit, a little bit later. We'll talk about it, but, um, yeah. It, so like you, I have not been flying much. Um, so that's that's where I've been. Also joining us today is a superb aviator and Squawk Ident podcast co-host. He is a retired U.S. Army colonel and former Black Hawk Battalion commander. His journey has led him to operate Apaches, Black Hawk C-12s, and UC-35s. He has a master's degree in management strategic studies. He is a former Embraer 145 and Boeing 737 pilot and currently a 7576 pilot for Trans Global. The name we use here on the show is an alias to his employer, a U.S. mainline carrier. Joining us off a summer vacation schedule with the family while working trips in between whoa from his home studio in northern virginia help me in welcoming to our show our very own terry s terry how you doing 
Hey, doing all right. Doing all right. You know, just uh, staying busy and uh, trying not to get called on reserve. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been a, a busy, busy summer. So um, between uh, vacations and family visits and uh, us traveling to visit family and, uh, you know, it's uh, it's been a pretty busy summer. I'm glad summer is coming to a close and things are starting to get back to normal. Um, kids are back in school. Uh, wife's at work today, so I got the house to myself. Nice, and you're podcasting. Good man. And I'm podcasting. There you go. Now, you mentioned earlier uh, when we were talking off air um, about your work rules have changed for reserve over at Transglobal, and they've gotten better. What can you tell me yeah. about that? Yeah, so, um, you know, we we signed our new contract. It was uh, last October, and uh, in it included a bunch of reserve rule changes, uh, and, and a lot of those changes didn't go into effect until uh, this month. So um, we we had some changes to our, our call-out, so long call reserve has now changed from uh, – 12 hour call out to 18 hour call out. So it gives you a little more time. It's a lot better for commuters. Um, we've got different types of lines now. Um, we have a, a straight up long call line where uh, really it's really good for commuters. They can just bid long call and, and that way they don't have to, uh, they can minimize their, their uh, use of crash pads and, and just, you know, general anxiety of, am I going to get called out for a short call? when I mean, you know, you're not going to on a long call line. So, um, got some other, uh, we've got a, a, it's called a voluntary early check line. Basically they can assign you something before 10 AM on your first day of reserve block. Mm. Um, which, uh, doesn't sound like much, but, uh, it pays a lot better too. So, um, it's, uh, depending on how many, uh, days in the bid period and it, it might pay 85 hours or 89 hours, uh, of, uh, minimum guarantee. So, uh, that's, that's good for, uh, for people who live local. I tried bidding for one of those for September and, and failed cause they went pretty senior. Can imagine, um, yeah. cause why not <laughs> right. pay, uh, get paid 89 hours to, uh, to sit a whole bunch of short calls, really. I mean, they're first up in the sheet for that, but, yeah. um, well, if you live in base, yeah, it's, it's so, a no brainer, right? It's just, Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. So we've had some reserve rule changes that have been, uh, been good, but, uh, apparently I couldn't hold reserve for next month. So I've got a line. That's fantastic. You got a line. Love it. Yeah. Wow. And, and any, uh, any interesting destinations in the last uh, few months? Um, let's see. Last weekend I was in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, a week before that I was in Munich. Um, where else? Uh, I did a Rome back in August or I'm sorry, back in July. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We Rome missed was... each other by like a week, I think. Yeah. 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 It wasn't, uh, <laughs> it wasn't that long, but, uh, yeah, it's so you know most of most of our trips here are uh, in, in this base and this fleet are uh, three day Europe. So yeah, um, I've got a uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of days because I'm on reserve. But uh, when I get my line for next month, um, looks like first stop is uh, Edinburgh, Scotland. So oh. I'll head there on the first of September. You gonna play some golf or something? <laughs> um, I'm going to try to trade out of it actually. So oh, really? I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, landing currency is an issue. Oh. So, oh. um, I expire for landings the last week of September. Oh, are you going to play that game all now? of my, well, <laughs> all of my September trips are, uh, are IRO, the yeah. relief officer. Yeah. So, uh, I'm not scheduled to get any landings, and if I don't, then I got to go to the simulator for landings class, and I, I'm trying to avoid that. Yeah, uh, I, I would much rather actually land the airplane than uh, than go do three bounces in the simulator because it always ends up being more than just three bounces. They do like V1 oh, yeah. cuts, and they well, you know, they turn here. into a training event. Right? Yeah, exactly. Right. While you're here. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I, I I'd much rather just go 
land the airplane. So I've I've got trades in for every trip to try to try to pick up a flying seat. We'll see. I gotcha. Good. Well, you know, I am so very excited that we have a returning guest today. As we mentioned in the intro, Keith is, is joining us today. And let's get right into it. Uh, let me introduce today's featured guest. A year into his retirement, he is a former Boeing 777 captain, a podcaster, and a film producer. He's a CFI, I, and MEI flight instructor, a float plane pilot, a commercial drone operator as well. His journey in aviation dates back to the year 1980, where he graduated from San Jose State University with a Bachelor's of Science in Aeronautics, Aviation, Aerospace Science, and Technology, and at USC, where he earned a Master's of Science in Aviation Safety. He's also, he also has a degree in Digital Media. He is a consultant at Eduvators and a VP of Red Zone, a digital media analysis and higher education company. Keith is also the host and creator of the Klezmer podcast, which highlights Klezmer and Jewish musical artists from around the world. He joins us today to talk about his life after retirement and his corporate flying career. Yeah, the bug really bit him hard, I guess, you know, he just wants to keep flying. I love it. Please help me in welcoming back to the show, Captain Keith Holzinger. Keith, how you doing? Well, hello, everyone. Yeah, well, we're doing great. Um, I didn't get it scheduled to fly today, so here we are. Yes, and you know, it's it's so great receiving text messages and emails from you, uh, from pictures from where you are, you're flying. Is it it's a citation? Is it a citation one? It's a citation Excel most of the time. Oh, Excel. Uh, oh, okay. I'll fly a citation Encore. And an Encore. Okay, so a little little bigger aircraft. This. And, uh, but and, you you cannot take a bad picture of this airplane. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good looking plane, <laughs> and you're a lot of a lot of mountain flying you've been doing as well, correct? A lot of flying, uh, Wyoming, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, um, Utah, some really spectacular spots that I really can't take a triple seven into. Yeah, yeah. Any what's like the shortest runway you like usually go to? Um. We'll have to think about that a moment. Uh, certainly not anything under about 4,000 feet in, in the Excel. So, uh, okay. but they do go into Santa Monica, um, which is a 3,000-ish foot airport. Yeah. I haven't done that yet myself, but um, it takes kind of our equivalent of a special qualification to do that. Oh, okay. Yeah. And for those listeners out there, you're thinking, oh, Santa Monica, California has an airport? Yes. Um, it is. If you're an AOPA listener or AOPA uh, magazine reader or member, you know that the Santa Monica Municipal Airport has been a point of controversy for decades now. Um, that airport's been there forever. It's just north of uh, LAX, and it it's it's a beautiful airport. I mean, you have beautiful views. It's surrounded by multi-million dollar homes. And those residents want that airport gone. And AOPA, along with other foundations locally, have been doing their best to protect it. As a matter of fact, the regulations there change constantly. Noise abatement procedures. It's a short runway. There's a, a procedure you have to take off. Even in a Cessna, if you ever can get in there, uh, in a Cessna, you go over there golf course, make a left, make a right, here, this, there, because of noise abatement. Um, so many noise complaints. As a matter of fact, I read an article recently talking about Santa Monica, how over a thousand of the 1,600 complaints that they received last year came from one person. And they all have to be filed. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, someone really has it out. And there's a fantastic documentary out there that has been out for, oh, I'd have to say almost almost 20 years, um, one six, right. If you haven't taken the time to watch the documentary one six, right. It is cinematically fan, just a beautiful, beautiful, um, piece of work there. Uh, filmically, um, the story as well is, is wonderful. I've talked about one six, right. Documentary a few times on the show. So yeah, but Santa Monica, um, pretty short runway, 3000 something feet. And, and historically the original home of the Douglas aircraft company, where they built a DC, to DC three line, you know, back in the 1930s and 40s. And it's hard to imagine a, a DC two or DC three, you know, being able to take off on such a short 
runway. And maybe it was the runway always that long? It I used to be know. longer. It used, used to be, to be longer, longer. And then the, the city shortened it to uh, uh, reduce the number of basically business jets that were operating there. Again, controversy, mm -hmm. a lot of... A yeah, lot they of basically <laughs> took it and the pavement was... Well, the last time I was um, around there, it was still there. It's just basically they've they've taken it and they've shortened it so much that it's not usable and it was to get the jets out of there so only the smallest jets can really go in there i know phenom still go in there some of the citations can go in there because we used to do that years ago and then they just kind of kept making the runway shorter not in pavement but a usable runway length and now yeah. it's down to three thousand feet oh, wow yeah, you know, and you would think, you know, any aviator out there worth their salt knows about Meg's Field in Chicago. Um, that was still open when I started flying. And it was one of the bucket list locations I wanted to fly a general aviation airplane into. Uh, unfortunately, I never got the chance to do it before the mayor decided to take bulldozers in the middle of the night and punch a bunch of holes in it because his wife wanted a park there. So, uh, again, huge controversy. There's so much drama and history in general aviation that most of us kind of just we're worried about getting our pilot's license and how quickly can I get to an airline and all that other stuff is kind of, you know, for those that are enthusiasts about history, they know it. But uh, I highly recommend all you young aviators out there that might be listening to this show, all five of you. Um, can you please <laughs> take a look at the history of general aviation? AOPA is such a great source. Um, for that. And there's plenty of things you can do in your local community as well. But Keith, I don't mean to, to go off on this tangent from you. You <laughs> last time we were on, you were on the show with us about a year ago, uh, you were retiring. You had just done your Finney flight and you were talking cryptically about what's next. And I am going to keep flying on a corporate level. And I got some job uh, opportunities lined up and you did it. Uh, within, I think, weeks of that show, you found an a employment opportunity, made you very happy. You were sharing so many photos with me, and I just so happy for you. How did that transition transpire for you? Uh, thanks, Tony. Well, let me back up a little bit. So from about the two-year point prior to retirement is when I started looking at the opportunities and started to do my networking. Uh, the, my intent was to not have really any gap between, uh, as I call it, graduating from the 121 world and then going on to the next phase in, in the basically the 135 world. So over those two years, I, I did things like going to the Paris Air Show, the Sun and Fun Air Show. I joined... Uh, the main organizations, I joined NAFI, the National Association of Flight Instructors, uh, the NBAA, National Business Aviation Association. I joined the Flight Safety Foundation. So I got all my ducks in a row so that when the time came, I would I would have some choices. Well, as it turned out, I didn't really have a lot of choices because of, um, I'll call it the stigma of uh, airline people uh, coming into business aviation. So we could talk about that a little bit later. But uh, there's some resistance in some quarters of business aviation to having airline people join them. I was very fortunate in my case that I had an acquaintance that was already at the company that I'm with now. And for a few months uh, before I actually went there, he'd been talking to them about my interest level and my background experience. I'd already worked for three different 135 operators prior to joining 121. So I had some previous background and experience of, of what's involved. But I didn't have any BizJet experience uh, because back in those days, you can't get the BizJet experience without having jet time and you can't get jet time without having a job. So it was kind of a catch 22. Yeah. So it never quite worked out for me. I did, you know, small, cargo flights, I did Grand Canyon Air Tours, I went to the commuter, and ultimately to the airline, which is, eh, I guess, kind of a bit more traditional path for um, non-military people. Although there were a few that had come into the 121 from business aviation because they got very lucky and were offered business jet employment um, early in their career. 
but uh, that didn't happen in my case. So now is my chance to catch up and fill that one little gap of uh, aviation that I hadn't had a chance to experience. So for me, uh, having left the airline in mid-August of last year, uh, I signed on uh, with my company uh, in early October of last year. I had to wait uh, about five weeks to uh, get a training slot at the training center and went through uh, two citation type rating courses in a three-week period. Uh, we can talk about how uh, training in the business aviation world is a little bit more compressed than it is in the airline world. Um, and then I started flying from the right seat to try to learn the airplane, the company procedures, and just how things uh, operate. So uh, about five weeks of flying from the right seat and then some from the left seat. And then I got my uh, 135 PIC sign off and became a captain. And it's been super fun. The people are great that I work with. Uh, the scheduling is great. Um, they're very close to where I live. And uh, I'm flying uh, about eight to 10 days uh, per month, although last month in July, I had a little bit more utilization. I did 13 days, but it's uh, it's super fun. The jet is fun. I'm going to a lot of places that I can't fit a 777 into, a lot of places I've never been to or haven't been in 40 years. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that the training is a lot more compressed. Now, we know what, well, at least we here on the on the panel know what airline training is all about it is drinking from a fire hose especially if it's your first 121 operator you're learning so many things simultaneously from company operations to systems to flows and procedures call outs uh, checklists uh, and emergency profiles and you're doing it all in usually about six weeks when you're new on equipment about six weeks of training and simulator and ground school and all that stuff and you now with the aqp program the advanced qualified program that most airlines have adopted in our country at least that everybody has to go through the same program the same questions you're not going to get some check airman somewhere or some oral examiner giving you some off, like how many fan blades are in this you know, condition and this, you know, whatever, that you're going to get all the same approved questions and you're going to get all the same approved uh, profiles. Um, and so that is good. There's a lot of at-home study involved in this as well. But when you're dealing with part one, part 91 or part 135, the training is usually contracted out to say flight safety or one of these companies that gives type ratings for all these myriad of operators out there that are doing charter. What was the main difference for you coming from all that experience of all those years of flying airline and airline requalifications and trainings and recurrence to a part 135? How, how was that? You know, it was surprisingly very similar. Uh, the 135 regulations um, very closely mirror the 121 regulations. Uh, there's a few differences. Uh, obviously, we have uh, longer duty days available, longer um, flight times per day available, and a few things like that. Most of the other rules are, are very similar. They're very strict on um, takeoff and landing minimums, requirements, Pilot qualifications, there's, uh, you know, the same 100-hour uh, higher minimum captain requirement. And there was a 40 hours of online training I had to do before we even started Simulator um, through a company called Advanced Air Crew Academy, hmm. which provides a lot of the online training. So it's basically like our 121 uh, quarterly distance learning. So a lot of that material we very closely mirrored what we would get in, in the 121 uh, distance learning quarterly, um, except it's a 40 hour kind of requirement. And, it, and there's a timer on the computer that makes sure that um, you, even if you finish soon, you can't, you can't uh, log off or go to the next module. So uh, the 40 hours is a hard 40 hours and there's a timer and you're going to do that 40 hours. And then I had to do um, 
a, uh, a, a oral exam with uh, our director of operations about 135 regulations and a company uh, manual uh, in the 135 world is called the GON, the General Operating Manual, General Operations Manual, um, which is the same as the, the our flight manual in uh, the 121 world. And uh, op specs, we have op specs, everything. It, it's very similar. So that, that transition was actually quite easy. Okay. Yeah. And how long did that training uh, last overall? Well, the ground training. Uh, was before the simulator uh, training, which I, as I mentioned was three weeks, and then mm -hmm. uh, going through the uh, general operating manual and the FARs and completing that oral exam prior to first flight. So, um, or I should say prior to uh, captain the PIC sign off. Um, and then I just completed my first uh, six month uh, PIC proficiency check in the simulator, which got slid into my grace month. So we have grace month uh, as well. And so I wanted to wait until at least I got that far through the career before I came back to you and, and wanted to talk about that. I wanted to get that first six month check done. Mm -hmm. And that check, it's very simple. You just go there, uh, brief for about a half hour, go in the simulator for about an hour and a half. And, and it's a pretty simple Oh. process. Now, I'll, when I come up on a year, I'll go through a recurrent training program, which will be, I think it's three days, uh, two or three days uh, footprint, yeah. uh, a couple of days of ground school in a simulator or two. So, um, and the simulator period is because you're the only one, you get a seat filler and the simulator periods are generally about 90 minutes rather than four hours. So you might uh, do a 90 minute period um, take a break, maybe do another 90 minute period or do it again the next day, something like that. Hmm. So the, since you're, you're the customer, so they're there to uh, guide you along and make sure you're comfortable doing what, what needs to be trained to. Right. Mm -hmm. So we talk about that in the airlines training proficiency, but you know, if you ask for an extra simulator, they, they still kind of look at you sideways, but here it, in in the 135 uh, 91 world uh, you're the customer and they're very good about making sure that you're comfortable and proficient before yeah. before you finish the program well it's billable hours right and i see roger that's, was kind that's of true. Yeah. about that I suppose so, like, yeah you're the customer roger's like <laughs> the biggest difference is you are literally the customer if the customers go away or if you fail too many people your customers will go to somebody else and then they're their source of income is going to go away. And that is a big difference between the airlines um, where you are, you know, you're the student, the people that are instructing you, like they are, I mean, in a way, not your boss, but your superiors in a way, and they can kind of flog you if they want versus they really cannot do that when you go to the flight safety of the CAEs. I mean, if, if, if the instructor wants to flog you as the customer, that customer is going to walk away it's, yeah. and not come back. So, well, so. you know, that that's true because, uh, you know, I, I got down to the training center a little bit early and I was waiting for my uh, designee to, to come down and uh, turns out, well, he had just been giving somebody prior to me a check ride. And he unfortunately had to, um, not pass them. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm like, well, I mean, the guy before me didn't pass, so you know what's going to happen to me. <laughs> yeah. But um and we discussed it very sadly, you know, the the gentleman just wasn't quite ready for his check ride. So um that you know, that happens. So if uh if it does, you know, you come back uh get another just like the airline, you get another training period and then um try the check ride another time because right. ultimately they they get everybody through uh you know because that's their the customer's you know job or their employment is is reliant on getting these check rides done so whatever it takes they you know extra training whatever um i find the training center was really good in that regard yeah i think uh there's the clear distinction is when you're flying for an employer like an airline and for the most part, all their training and their simulators are all in-house. So it costs them money. And they're, and we've seen this over the last couple of decades. Their 
purpose is to get you through with minimal time invested. Because if they can work out an AQP program where you do a lot of self-study and then you're in the simulator for this minimum amount of time and the FAs approve this program, that means giving you an extra sim. Now, most companies, especially at Mainline, will tell you, hey, man, don't worry about it. If you need an extra sim, we got you. You know, we got you. But for the most part, the instructor will go, oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. You learn it on the line. You know, they just, they just want to get you in and out because they've got a long line of pilots that are waiting for the next sim slot. And so you it's just a different mindset. But then as you and Roger have discussed, you know, when you're dealing with a private entity giving you your training, like CAE or flight safety, uh, you are the customer. And, and like Roger said, they want you back. They want you to come back, have a positive experience. And even those DEs, those designated examiners, they don't want to have to do the paperwork. They want to pass you. And if I've, I saw this myself in my own career uh, when I was in those kind of roles, it's like the last thing I want to do is do extra paperwork. What can we do to get you to see the light so that you can correct the issue that you're having in this session so we don't have to come back and do another one? But if you're not, no worries. We'll get you another session. We'll get you through. Um, but it's, it's again, it's like billable hours. That's just a bonus. Like If you don't make it through on the first one, it's not like they're going to you know, hit you over the head with the, with the frying pan going, no, oh, you have to get this done in so many hours. No, it's okay. Come back. Come back. It's all right. Because, you know, they're just going to send the, the, the bill to the company. Um, so, yeah, I can see the difference in the mindset and in the atmosphere as well. Now you've, you've experienced both, um, the training and you've mentioned the differences there. What do you think are the biggest differences between the flight schedules and the flying? Like I, I, you, we all know, okay, you know, you get a line or you're on call or, you know, we talk about this on the show all the time, you know, the, the stress involved with an airline, a 121 flight schedule. Versus, I mean, it sounds like you're flying around the same 13, 14 days a month. You were doing that when you were a senior captain on the triple, right? So what's the difference? You're just not gone for as many days in a row or? Um, <clears throat> yeah. So the scheduling, w typically we fly turns, right? So we go out and end up uh, returning to base sometime during that calendar day. Occasionally we're away for uh, one night, typically maybe once a month or so I'm away overnight. Sometimes uh, a couple of nights if something else comes up in between. Now, here, here's what can happen is um, you're planned for a particular flight, you go somewhere and you come back. Well, when you go somewhere, it's like getting to a hub at the airline. Um, you're kind of on the hook to do something else yeah, and because they're always trying to um, sell the the return empty leg, so if they can sell that return empty leg or send you uh, somewhere not too far away, and then they can sell that segment back to the, your base or even a third destination, they'll do that. So um, once you're out and you're out and back, might turn into a out and then somewhere else, and then take people to a fourth place and then go home. So that happens sometimes, or sometimes uh, it could, it could turn into an overnight when you weren't planning for it. So um, <laughs> I have been caught, uh, I got caught once um, with nothing on an overnight that wasn't planned. And um, so I kind of learned my lesson for that, at least bring uh, um, a change of things and, and uh, uh, bathroom kit. Uh, no matter where I'm going, uh, unless we're planning to take revenue pastors back to home base, then, you know, at least you're going to get home that day. <laughs> um, yeah. But absent that, uh, it, if you're on the schedule available for a few days, then then they might use you. As far as the, the scheduling goes, it's very straightforward. There's no minimum or maximum number of days per month, necessarily. Some 135 operators I have like an eight on, six off, or they want 14 days a month or something uh, along those lines. Uh, with my company, we tell them what days off we request, and then they usually uh, grant that. And then the rest of the time, 
we're basically on reserve. Generally, we just get scheduled uh, a day in advance, but occasionally, uh, as I mentioned to you uh, before we started, that you might have a, a short notice trip or uh, a trip for an organ transplant, something like that. Right. Uh, which are really kind of cool because, you know, I, I feel like I'm really uh, helping. So you're, you're really saving a life when you're doing those organ transplant trips. Um, I've also done one uh, uh, prisoner trans transfer trip. So uh, you take a prisoner and a couple of uh, prison guards and you take them uh, usually somewhere for some medical treatment or something mm -hmm. that they need to be repositioned for. So that's a, a little different kind of an aspect. It's also interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Now you, so it sounds like to me, it's not like a two weeks on, two weeks off or one week on, one week off. More of it is, hey, these are the days I want off for the month, next month. Then they'll either grant or deny them. And then the rest of the time, you're basically kind of on a mostly long call situation, but occasionally they'll call you and say, hey, we got a trip. Can you do it? And if you if you say yes, do you have the option to say yes or no? Uh, yes. So, but a lot of times, what what happens in my case, since I've, you know, got my retirement from the airline and I've got the pension coming in, uh, I defer the flying uh, a lot of the time to the people whose this is their only job and the only job they've hmm. had. So this is the job that they're paying their rent or their mortgage with. And so, um, and we're paid a, a, on a daily basis. So it's a flat rate per day that you show up, okay. whether you fly two legs or six, it's the same pay. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether you're flying the small plane or the big plane, it's the same pay. Okay. Um, but there, there is a tiered uh, scale based on your uh, number of flying hour experience and the number of years with the company. But as far as the scheduling goes, I try to defer to the people that need the work more than I do. So if they need me, I'm, I'm happy to go. But if somebody else is out there that, that needs it for their pay, sure. that um, I'll always uh, defer to that. So um, they call that a, a refreshing outlook on the, on the employment situation. So yeah. uh, they're very, Happy to have me with with that um, outlook on the compensation side. Sure. Now, you, you earlier we talked about the stigma, and I know Roger and I have had this conversation uh, when Roger was at his previous employer. He was basically the director of flight, and he had to deal with a lot of hiring and managing and schedules and aircraft maintenance and all kinds of logistics for his previous employer. Um, and we often talked about the stigma of airline, not just retired airline pilots, but airline pilots in general in the 135 or Part 91 corporate flying world. And Keith, you mentioned that as well. Now, can you, can you tell me firsthand experience now, what stigma are you referring to? Can you give us some detail on what you've seen and how you try to combat those preconceived notions? Well, that's a whole uh, discussion topic by itself. But uh, so, as I mentioned, I was trying to line things up for about two years prior to actually leaving the airline. And I would see, uh, you know, job notices on the online boards and things. And I, I would uh, I would apply and uh, either get nothing or um, something like, you know, uh, they didn't really want uh, former airline people for whatever reason. So, but when I looked a little bit deeper into it, uh, and, and I even I had a little bit of uh, resistance at, at first at my employer, uh, and until they got to know me a little bit better. But the stigma is that airline pilots are prima donnas. They want to work uh, as few days as possible and get the most money. And I know this is completely untrue. And, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and the, honestly, in the airline world, sometimes we're our own worst enemy in that regard, right? Uh, the other thing is that we tend to um, 
do things only in a certain way and we're not flexible. And this is what we did at the airline. And, you know, um, that's how we're going to do it in the 135. And we've all been in the airline world enough to know that things are not static. Things are changing all the time. There's changes to the company procedures manual. There's changes you know, to the airplane flight manuals. <clears throat> and the point at the airline is, and you know that when changes come down the line, some people are resistant mm -hmm. and some people accept it and, and go with it. So, uh, and every time there's a merger, there's some change in procedures, right? Uh, so, well, and this it's is the like, way we did well, it at X, and this is the way we did it. That's right. At y. This is the way we did it, and that's the way I'm going to do it it's for the rest of my way. life. Right, right. That's right. My way is better, and I'm going to now impose my way on, on your operation. But the truth is, and at the airline, you got to be a bit of a chameleon because when those changes come, you have to accept them and do them because that's that's now the job. So if they want flaps before gear, fine. If they want gear before flaps, fine. Whatever the operator uh, puts in the manual, whatever they train to, that's what you do. So the the question becomes, can you chameleon your, yourself to the point of adapting to the new way of doing things at your new operator. So, and even among 91-135 operators from one to the next, there's a difference in procedures. So the question is, can you uh, follow those procedures, follow the manual and do things the, the way they want? So if you can do that, then you're going to have a good experience. If not, you're going to have some some resistance. But um, my attitude has has been, if they can do it, I can do it too. And whatever I have to do to uh, mold myself in, into their operation, their way of doing things, their way of operating the airplane, their way of... Um, doing everything that's involved with the with the flight and the customer interaction, then I can learn and, and do that just like changing fleets at the airline, right? Because uh, Airbus doesn't fly like a Boeing and the procedures aren't the same. And if you try to do Airbus procedures in a Boeing, you're going to get in trouble. If you try to do Boeing procedures in an Airbus, it's not going to end well. So, yep. <laughs> um, and the the better you are at adaptation, the the better you're going to uh, succeed. So, uh, in addition, don't let a lot of time lapse before you decide to go um, into the into the business aviation world. Uh, you know, I tried to minimize my uh, time between the airline and the 135 because I wanted to show that I was current and legal and that I had recently passed uh, 121 training, and it's easy to slide over. If you've let six months, nine months, a year, a year and a half go by, and you haven't touched an airplane, and now you're going to go through a compressed training program, uh, that's a bigger fire hose than we're normally used to. Right. The stigma that I'm hearing is primarily the idea that airline pilots are kind of set in their ways and that they're resistant to change. And the truth is, I think most people are resistant to change, especially with their jobs. They get to know a particular job, how many people, friends, family members have said, yeah, you know, job's okay. I like, I like the job, but you know, and it, why don't you leave? Why don't you change? Well, because that takes work and then I gotta learn something new and I can do my job relatively easily. I don't have to be retrained. I, I've been doing this a long time. It's just so it kind of makes sense that the human condition is once you get to know a particular job and you do it easily, you're willing to be unhappy doing it before you move forward. And I think with that aspect, and I'm no I'm no doctor or clinician of any kind, so you know take take my words with a grain of salt. But for the most part, I think people, they'll stay in a job that they're not excited about because 
they know it. They know it well, and they don't have to go through that fire hose training. They don't have to learn something new. They don't have to change their cycle, their behavior. And I think the same applies here. And the stigma comes from that at, at its core, that when you work at a particular company and then that gets merged with another, you're going to always have resistance between the groups, at least for the most part. There are those pilots, like I think present company here, that know that, hey, I don't own this aircraft. The company owns the aircraft. So I'm going to fly it the way the company wants me to fly it today. Tomorrow, it might change. Next week, it might change. We've seen this. Like you said, it's very cyclical on how we operate. It's so this week we're doing this, flaps first. Next week we're going to do gear for whatever. And we all have something to say about it because, man, I just, I just memorized that checklist. I've been doing that checklist. How crazy did we go over at Legacy Airlines when we got rid of the 10,000 foot call? Everybody was like, this is the most stupid. I've been saying 10,000 as a, as a oral call for, for like the last five airlines for the last 30 years. And now they want me to remove, I'm going to say it anyway. I want to say it anyway. And you're on and the And what line. about when they, when they started the 1,000-foot uh, stable call? Yeah. We, they didn't have that before, and all of a sudden now we have to say 1,000-foot stable. And then at 500, do it again. It's like, oh, yeah. why? Why? Well, because, because... somebody decided. Somebody decided that, hey, if you're not stable at 1,000 feet, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to go around, and we had way too many unstable approaches according to the FOQA data. Uh, so and, flight operations... And guess what? That came insurance. from the FAA also. Yeah. <laughs> Because they, they saw the data as well. They get the data as well. Boeing gets the data. Airbus gets the data. Everyone gets the data, right? So what are you going to do with that? Oh, well, we should add 1,000-foot call. And everybody was up in arms going, well, this is stupid. I'm saying it again. You know? And then I flew with guys. I remember I was flying with some captains. They're like, 1,000-foot, stable. And then a 500, stable again. You know? So, okay, I guess you don't like this call. <laughs> but I think that's where the stigma comes from. Uh, and, and, How about when, when, when they started making the, uh, the FOs do the prepare for takeoff PA? Yes, I remember that. Yeah. Um, flight attendants, prepare for takeoff. And then at the gate, ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated with your seatbelt securely fastened about you. The aircraft comes to a complete stop and the captain turns off to fasten the seatbelt sign. Yeah. How many times have I said that in my lifetime? <laughs> we don't do that anymore. You know, so it's just, I, mean, I bet you it'll come back. I, I don't know. <laughs> but things. Next time there's a change in leadership, right? <laughs> yeah. It, well, it's probably going to happen more sooner than that. Um, so, yeah. It, but it, <laughs> but the, it the stigma part, and I, I want to ask Terry about this because there's also. A bit of a stigma with military people going to the airlines, and I want to see if if Terry had experienced any of that. Um, you know, I I'll say no. I mean, about half of my class was military, and uh, and I didn't really notice anything in particular. I mean, I I did have a little bit of a one twenty one background as well. So, um, when I when I got to Trans Global, so so I don't know if that was. Uh, a factor or not, but I, I don't know. I, I haven't noticed it if there is. Yeah. And Roger, I know you were kind of chomping a little bit there. What were I, don't you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess, I mean, I guess I'm kind of coming at you mentioned at the beginning of this segment, mm -hmm. you know, I have sat on the other end of this and I think Keith did touch on, he, he touched on some of it, but then like the, you know, being against change is kind of really a smaller part of it. Um, I think, and then a, a bigger part comes to what you did mention, Keith, is the prima donna aspect, and it's something that I kind of poke fun at you guys. And 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 I have to preface this way: this is this because this is an individual thing, right? We're we're kind of stereotyping. We're, we're stereotyping. Airline pilots, Keith, I can tell is is a little bit is different, and he's basically wants to keep flying, and he's going to adapt, which was you know a word that came up a lot into whatever needs to needs to be done. But <laughs> for lack of better terms, airline pilots and their contract is like their security blanket, and they want to manipulate everything that they can according to what is going to best serve them and their wallet, which Keith mentioned. And how I can do the least amount of work in order to do that. And in the 121 world where you have a contract and you can do that contractually by definition, 
that becomes very, very different. And I'm sure that Keith can come and he can attest to that. Whereas now he's in the 135 world living in an extremely dynamic environment where he is left without his underwear because something changed. And there are a lot of people that have spent, and the more time that they have spent in that airline world, the harder it is for them to grasp the fact that this is a dynamic environment and they can't do anything about it. And just because I added a leg to your trip doesn't mean that you're going to get paid anymore because you're played on a you're paid on a flat daily rate. Are you paid on a salary basis on a and on an annual salary basis? It doesn't matter what the change is. You have to do it, and you don't have a contract that you can go and say, "Oh well, but my contract says," because I can tell you that there is that that's where a lot of this a lot of this comes from. I, a majority of this comes from there is other aspects. Yes, there is the change. Airline pilots definitely do kind of like to come in. You guys were just talking about all you know your stable calls and your ten thousand foot calls, and there is an element of that that they want to kind of well, we did it this way, and I think that this is the greatest way that was ever invented in the history of mankind. There is that element, um, but it's much smaller than if you want to put the prima donna um, part in it. And there also is outside of everything else. There is from a post 121 retirement world, there is insurance considerations that depending on the operation that you're going to run, insurance can also become a little bit more prohibitive. Um, uh, less cost effective, I guess is maybe a better way to put it. Um, but that kind of starts to come in. That's a small part of it as well. But like I say, I, a lot of it comes from the fact that the change in the dynamic environment and that there's not any way that they can argue it or make it serve them financially, and yet it's putting them out and they can't do anything about it, that that's kind of where a lot of things, um, where a lot of the issue, a lot of the issues kind of stem from in my, in my experience. So, um, you talk about us being prima donnas here. Here is the, um, that was, I just, I just for, want to uh, put, I just want to throw this out there real quick. The Keith used that before I did. So I just, <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there before you go off on this tangent. Here's, 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 here's my, here's my ringtone. Here's my ringtone for crew scheduling. Uh -uh. No. Oh. oh man. All right. I had a siren for my, for my ringtone for crew scheduling. My, Mine the Imperial March from, Oh, that's uh, mine from Star Wars. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's mine. But mine well, is the "Come it. Fly with Me" song. <laughs> oh wow! See, that's so positive, Keith. That's, so positive. Yeah, that's yeah. way more positive. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I think that that lends itself to the idea that each that each person is an individual, and they're going to respond to these changes a lot differently. You know, Keith obviously wanted to keep flying. He's he's touched on some of these things, and he's willing to to do this stuff just to keep flying, including taking the the daily rate of, of the other pilots and how they need that to pay their rent and basically saying, look, I don't need it, but I'm going to fly when you guys need it. Like, that's a very different mentality than some of the other people that are out there that want to just kind of come in and, and work Make the money system. There's a lot of manipulation nothing. that airline pilots like to do. And you can't do that when you move into the 135 and the 91 world. Well, now you know why Keith... World was able to land a position post-retirement. His, his attitude, deal. attitude is attitude. everything. Since the day we met, since the day he says, hey, aren't you Aviator Tony in the LAX crew room? Um, since the day we met, uh, Keith has had a, just a wonderful attitude. And as you can even mention, like when crew scheduling called, he had come fly with me. I mean, that's so positive. That's like, a minority that's right like, there. They're like, that's special, you know? And I don't know if you guys heard it. I, I kind of, I didn't mean to play it so, so loud, but yeah. Um, like Terry, when crew scheduling calls, I have also. Oh boy. I got we'll assigned a trip, right? So I have a little bit different mentality, but I think that I make up for it in other ways. Um, so having the right attitude, I think, is key. To transition from one operator to another, to transition from a part 121 to a part 135 or part 91 operator, especially post-retirement, you have to have the right attitude. You have to have that chameleon mindset. That's the only way it's going to work. Also, I wanted to mention that shameless plug, transitioning. 
from military to airlines or from CFI to airlines, we've had a guest on the show that has had a very successful side gig. We're talking about Airline Transition Manual. This is a fantastic book. I highly recommend it for all those CFIs out there or all those people that are in their last year of military service. Thank you for your service. Before you get to the point where you're getting ready to retire, I highly recommend this book. It's called the Airline Transition Manual. You can find it on pretty much any platform, but go right to their website to read up more about it. It's airlinetransition.org. It was written by Richard Swindell, Joanna Whitvlet, and our friend, Andrew Ross. So shameless plug out there for all of you that are curious about transitioning from a CFI world, general aviation world, cargo world, or military world, and you want to get into a part 121 world, that's a great resource. It'll explain schedules and regulations and, and FOMs and systems and how to prepare to get ready for class, how to get prepare for the simulator. So highly recommend that book. But back to the show. Um, transitioning from one aspect to another, you have to go in with an open mindset. And Keith, I think, has amply explained how he did it. Um, it, it's, it was probably because of your attitude, not a big deal for you, but what were the biggest challenges in that transition? Well, let's see. The challenge was to learn the ins and outs of the 135. So when in, in the airline, you know, Dispatch calculates a flight plan. You they you download the flight plan on your iPad. You uplink it via A cars to your FMS, and you go flying. If you want to change your flight plan, you got to make a call. You got to call the dispatcher. If you want to change your fuel, you got to call the dispatcher. If you um, have a performance question or uh, uh, again, something with the fuel or the the loading, you got to call the load room uh, for weight and balance. If you got a weather question, you got to check with the dispatcher. Uh, there's gate agents, there's baggage handlers, there's fuelers, there's every department that you have to call if you want to uh, change anything, update anything, anything changes. Not to mention crew schedule or crew tracking. Uh, here, you're going to go do a flight. Okay, you go do the flight plan. You check the weather. You check how much fuel you're going to need. There's, uh, as Roger knows, a lot of places you go, you have to unload a minimum amount of fuel in order to waive some of the fees that are involved. We're worried about the, the financial aspect of this as well, because now um, you're kind of in control of what the company has to pay for things. Uh, they, they give you a company credit card, and now you're responsible for keeping things within, uh, you know, ordinary limits on, on expenses. So once you take that airplane, that's your airplane, your operation. Now, you do get a lot of support from the company. If you got a question on something, they're there for you uh, every step of the way. So the support is, uh, and it's it's the individuals, right? So it, People own this company. It's not a corporation. And they're invested in in every crew pairing, every flight, every airport you go to, every FBO you touch. So they've got a lot of things in place, but you still have to um, make some of these choices. Uh, you want to take fuel here. Or you want to take fuel there. Where's Where's the best fuel price? Where do you want to spend the night? Is the hotel more expensive here than it is there? If you're going into a ski resort in the winter time, it's an expensive hotel. If you're going uh, maybe to a smaller airport, maybe the hotel is less expensive than at the bigger airport uh, city. So uh, do you want to skip fueling at a certain airport and, and pay the fees? Because their fuel is expensive. Is it $10 a gallon or is it you know four fifty a gallon? So things like that. And then there's the the passengers. So the, the passengers have been great. They're usually pretty high net worth individuals or an occasional celebrity. Mm -hmm. And 
you've got to uh, deal with them, get them situated, brief them. You're the flight attendant doing the pre-takeoff briefing. You're making sure the bags are loaded correctly and the weight and balance is in order. And, uh, you know, the airplane's pre-flighted properly. Do you need to get de-iced in the wintertime? Do you, you know, and then de-icing, you pay by the gallon of de-icing fluid. So um, can you get the plane de-iced with just type 1 or you need type 1 and, and 4? Or do you need to just, uh, you know, do a minimum amount? So it's not like a flat fee to do a de-icing. It's, it's a, a fee plus how many gallons of fluid they're using on you. So, you know, there's, there's a lot to this. And the, uh, well, we're not locked behind the reinforced cockpit door because everybody's trying to do harm to us. Uh, and that's not to say, we, you know, we, we do have the ability to block off the cockpit, you know, if we, if we need to. Um, people bring pets, they bring dogs. And, you know, you might go to reach for something and get a wet nose, uh, a handful of wet nose there. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, the pets I've carried have all been very well behaved. And they're, I think they're used to traveling on, on these kinds of planes. Yeah. So, you know, they're not a problem. And um, families with, with kids or, you know, what, whatever the case may be, maybe it's a single individual going for a business meeting. Uh, the, the variety is is incredible, and it's it's a lot of fun, and we have a lot of control over the minutia of of the operation that we just didn't quite have uh, in the airline world. Yeah, and I just kind of want to go this and this. I had one question kind of for Keith, and Keith, you just kind of answered it, and all of which are great points. And this is another of the big things: is it's more more work on the 91 and 135 because you are in control of all that minutia. You don't have individual departments that do each of these things and you pick up, you know, I don't make any decisions. Like, you know, they, they want to take almost all the decision-making away from you guys at the airlines. Whereas those decisions stay with you in the 135 and 91 world and, and different operations are different. And I can tell you, I mean, just going from my last job to this current job and my last job, you know, all the minutia really came back to the pilots. And you know, yeah, I was the one that got the questions. I got the phone calls when those questions did come up. Um, but it's as stupid as stuff as those ramp fees that Keith, you brought up. I mean, what is the ramp fee? How much fuel do I need to get? Is it actually worth it to take this amount and pay $10 a gallon to waive an $1,800 ramp fee? Um, whereas you just show up and you get a stack of papers in the 121 world and you go and you take off and you fly an ILS and then you land, and then you walk away from the airplane. There's a lot more that goes into it, and this is something that we've talked about multiple times on different episodes of this show. Um, would you say, Keith, that overall, that it is more work doing, even if it's somewhat enjoyable, because I would actually kind of argue that I like it, but would you say that it's a little bit more work in the 135 world than when it was in the 121 world? Yes, I agree. I agree with you, uh, Roger. It it is more work, and but like you say, I think it's more enjoyable because you have a little bit more control. Absolutely, more in, input. Uh, there's a lot of support from the company. I, it, absolutely, and because they make the fuel plan, they figure it out whether it's best to take the minimum fuel or just to pay the the landing fee. They they know all, where the lower price hotels uh, for a particular city are going to be. So we get some guidance on those things and some recommendations. And and uh, uh, sometimes it's like, uh, well, you're going somewhere and, you know, let us know how much fuel you would need. And then we'll let you know whether to take the fuel or to pay the fees. Um, we never worried about fees at, at the airline and we didn't know what the fees were. So, um, because that stuff had all been contracted at a high level because you have many airplanes from that carrier going to that destination every day and many hotel rooms that are needed for the pilots and the flight attendants. So all that stuff has been, you know, the transportation even, you know, so we rent a car or take an Uber. Um, we're not contracted with a limo company or running around in shuttles. Um, and a lot of times, uh, you know, we don't pick the uh, hotel until we arrive at the whatever destination we decide we're going to end up that night. So the stuff is not prearranged. On the other hand, we get the hotel points. We get 
uh, if we're airlining somewhere, we get the airline miles. So there are some uh, benefits that I wasn't really aware of when I got started. And um, and Roger, you can talk about the the uh, the fuel points programs from the FBOs and and people are getting money at the end of the year from from the FBOs for for taking fuel. So there's some incentives to the pilots to take fuel at certain places. So I haven't gotten any of that money yet, but maybe Roger, you can explain how that works. So that's again, highly variable. Um, at my current job, we do not get any of the fuel points. I mean, we buy so Tons. much gas, <laughs> so much gas. Um, at my last job, we did. I mean, you, you know, um, I know that we did primarily Atlantic um, and Atlantic has a rewards program and that went straight to the pilots. Um, we primarily use Signature now. Signature has tailwinds and that actually goes into a, I don't know, a, a pilot group account that is used for end of the year activities. I'll just put it that way. So we kind of get it as a group effort mm. kind of towards the end. Um, the hotel points are great. Um, you know, you, you you can go anywhere and you can pretty much pay for a hotel. I mean, it sounds like you're only doing a couple overnights a month, but when I mean, I had the high, I had Hilton Diamond status and Platinum Marriott status at the same time. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to that. That kind of means that I'm gone a lot. Um, we don't airline all that much. You guys definitely that you're non revving at the airlines was was definitely a more cost effective way to travel around that way. Yeah. But there are definitely um, perks. There are definitely perks to it. Um, you know, I I made the jump to corporate quite a while ago. I don't have any plans to go back, but it is different. Um, well, but that's here's another thing. I I did my my first flight, and at the end of my first flight. The passenger gave me and my captain a tip. I'm like that'll happen occasionally. A tip? Don't get used Pilots to it. Get tips? Just to interact with the passengers. It can also can also be a thing that because you are the forward face of that operation now and flying, you know, those high net individuals, you, you can't necessarily act like the airline captain and just kind of hang out up front in your protected vestibule up there. <laughs> um, Tony, there's mu there's much more interaction. And then Tony, you can maybe can earn a little bit of scratch on the side. Yeah. Tony, could you imagine if each passenger you flew gave you a dollar? Well, I make that in the PA, ladies and gentlemen, the landing will be uh, <laughs> a good landing if everyone can just uh, donate the $5 PayPal right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it's a running joke. I know Spirit Airlines always has these memes out there going, ladies and gentlemen, there's a thunderstorm ahead. If we can collect two thousand dollars from our passengers, we will uh, use the fuel to avoid it. If not, that uh, well, it's gonna hold on. It's gonna be a bumpy ride. Um, it's a running joke. Uh, on Southwest, one time I was uh, uh, just non revving, trying to get to work, commuting, and the captain had his hat on the center pedestal, and he's like, "This is for uh, tips uh, for non revs that sit in my jump seat." Uh, and I pulled out like lint out of my pocket. I'm go, "Here you go." <laughs> I'm an art, I'm a regional uh, pilot. There you go. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a different lifestyle. And that's it's so important to discuss that here on the show, because there are many listeners out there that might be deciding, well, I don't know if I want to go to the airline. It's too cyclical. Maybe I'll go part 135. Yeah. You're doing more work. You're throwing bags like Roger, like last time we talked about, um, how you threw a back out, uh, about a year ago, uh, like doing stuff and then trying to get doors open and closed. I mean, you've had so many issues that we don't worry about that at the airline level. That We got people that do that. We're, the liability on us is too great. No, no. I was not trained. I'm not, I can't open that aircraft door. Call, call the JetBridge uh, driver down here to open the door. All you got to do is open the door of the airplane so you can get on. The JetBridge is attached. Just, just go. No, no. I, if anything happens, if anything happens, uh, you know, it's, I, I, I can't take that responsibility. So, um, so yeah, there's an a issue, clear uh... and present difference. <laughs> I had an issue uh, a couple trips ago where where the one of the doors on the airplane wouldn't uh, there was a light that wouldn't go out and flight attendants wouldn't touch it, you know. So they, they're not trained on it; they couldn't touch it. Well, because of the liability. Because so, what if what if right. even though they know that okay, but, it's probably but apparently I could. Apparently I oh. could. The captain sent me back there to 
open and close the door. Well, be careful with that. Whatever your out. manual says, yeah, be careful <laughs> with that. But speaking of, um, you know, I see here joining us in the room is another of our fantastic co-hosts. Let me introduce him so he can join in on the conversation. Uh, today, an outstanding aviator and Squawk Ident co-host has decided to join us. He's a former U.S. Navy Reserve's Chief Information System Technician, a certified flight instructor, and Embraer 175 pilot for Sandpiper Regional, and alias to one of Legacy Airlines' wholly owned regional airlines. Joining us from day two of his trip sequence, where he just checked into his layover hotel at the Four Points in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. From high atop the fifth floor of his mobile studio, please help me in welcoming to the show, Mr. Alex D. Alex, how you doing? I'm alive. Let's do it that way. I'm alive. I'm here. Uh, I haven't been on an episode in probably, what, two, three months? Yeah. And uh, yeah. we've been keeping in contact. Uh, you and me, for sure, have been keeping in contact about a lot of things that's been going on uh, in my personal life. Uh, sharing a very similar path right now, uh, going down the road. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, if, I mean, I'll, I'll put it out there. I, I have, uh, we talked, you talked about it on a previous episode. I definitely have the uh, AIDS, aviation induced divorce syndrome going on right now. Yeah, so going sorry. That. Yeah. Um, it is what it is at this point. Um, up to the courts and that's where we're at we've got um lawyers working on both sides of it that's yeah where we're at right now yeah and alex you know alex and i have been going back and forth quite a bit um doing our best to keep each other in check with with that um i said it on the last show or the show before actually uh, where we talked about what is AIDS, you know, because we we're like, well, AIDS, airline induced divorce or aviation induced divorce syndrome. And, and there was a stigma with that, too. A lot, a lot, we were talking a lot about stigmas today. Um, and, you know, it's always the pilot's fault because, you know, no, no, it's it, it's tough. This c aviation career sometimes can be tough. Now, that's the aviation career is not really the reason that I went through it. And it's not really the reason why Alex and thank you for sharing that, Alex, um, it is going through it. It's the stigma. Um, it's something else. And it's personal for each person. It's very dynamic. Um, and I said it on that show on, on 145, Flight 145, um, I wouldn't wish a divorce on my worst enemy. It's just nope. not the stress, the, the stages of grief, all that stuff. So, Alex, I'm so sorry to hear about your current situation. Thank you so much for joining us. I know it's been a while. Um, but you know, there's, and I know it's, it's very personal. So, and I'm not going to ask you any questions on it. Cause I, that's, that's for you, um, to, to deal with and contend with, but just know that your friends are here for you. And if you ever need anything, I know our listeners out there have a sympathetic ear uh, as they did with me when I announced what I was going through. I'm sure they'll be the same with you. Yeah, no, and uh, you know I appreciate it, and definitely appreciate you, Tony, over the past you know couple months of us just talking back and forth because we've been uh, obviously down a very similar path right now, and you know it sucks. I, I it, there's no other way to describe it other than it sucks. Yeah, um, I wouldn't wish wish it on my worst enemy, and for me this sucks because it's number two for me. Um, it is what it is. Uh, the first one came about cause of military and it was a military induced divorce syndrome. So, um, you know, I, I, it, and my current situation is definitely not because of the airlines. Um, it's, you know, personal matters that, you know, was between me and now I'm going to be my ex-wife. Yeah. That's where it stands. Well, you know, you've got the support, um, and thank you so much for being here and thank you for sharing that with us. You know, it's very personal um, and will respect uh, your privacy as well by, by, by not asking a million questions because that's what a lot of people always have a million questions. Um, but yeah. yeah, we were today, we've just to catch you up, we've uh, been talking to Keith. Uh, Keith and Alex, have you guys been on the same show? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, Keith uh, was gracious enough to join us today since he's not flying and he's told us about the transitioning from the airline world his retirement almost a year to the day uh a, a year ago and how quickly he was able to transition from the 121 into the 135 world we've been talking about the stigmas related to hiring airline pilots we've also been discussing the training differences on the processes and the similarities as well um the the duration of time is sounds like it's about the same uh you know 
usually a couple months to get it all situated. But we've also been uh, just now with Roger and Terry, we've been talking about um, how the job is different. You know, you're throwing bags, yeah. you're, you're the face of the company, you're interacting. Hopefully you have a good personality because you're interacting with multi-million dollar clients, if not more. And so you can't just hide in your bubble in the phone booth up there and close the door and make a PA in your, in your best captain voice uh, possible and, and then just leave it alone. And also all the other departments that are uh, at your discretion there in the TEM or threat and error management model. We talk about how all the other departments at the airline are there to help you. They're they're basically there to do your job. And I know you you sat in for a little bit of that conversation in the last few minutes. And we talked about how, hey, you know, pi most pilots, flight attendants, gate agents, like they know their job and they will do their job mm -hmm. and they will not go out of their way uh, because, hey, it's not my responsibility. There's a liability involved there because if I do something wrong and the slide blows, my job's done. I, they're going to fire me because I'm just a number. I'm a part yeah. number, right? So at a part 135 operation from what, I'm learning here today from Keith and Roger is that, no, you have to go out of your way. You're expected to handle it, get the mission done, take care of it. If they didn't load the right ice, make a phone call, call the FBO. Hey, my client wants the baby ice, not the big cubes. Can you make it happen? You know? So there's a lot more involved and the stigma comes a lot from the prima donna mentality that us airline pilots are often labeled with. Well, Roger's been I, fighting that battle for years. See, Keith, I, I, just I didn't want to say, say anything, and yet Alex knew it was. He knew it was there. I, I just mean, want to say, having having spent ten years on the in the military version of one thirty five, mm -hmm. I'm not completely oblivious, and I, I I can appreciate what you guys do. Yes, yes, and thank you, Terry. Now, just to kind of like not like lose track, because we're going to also talk about resume building and stuff, and I'd li love to get Keith's um, input on that mm -hmm. before he has to go. Um, but the one thing I wanted to mention, we, uh, Keith mentioned earlier that pilots have a contract on a 121 career path that is their Bible. Uh, according to section two, part six, uh, alpha, uh, I'm not, you know, if I get reassigned, then I have to give me this much amount. Of, and if it's a 4.5, then that means they have to give me a hotel and it, uh, the contract says right there. And we have a union hotlines where we can call 24 hours a day and some volunteer will pick up the phone and go, Hey, uh, the scheduling just tried to reassign me. And they gave me a 14 hour and 45 minute rest period in between the reassignment. And I'm supposed to have 13 and I, so Oh, well, according to contracts, subpart this, subpart that. Yeah, you're supposed to have 13. Call them back. Talk to a supervisor. I talked about this on the last show. Yeah. Add on 135 operation, you don't have that. Okay. So with that said, I recently had an event I'd like to share with you guys. About a month ago, I flew with a pilot that I flew with at Sandpiper. And I saw his name on the, on the NS or on the, the schedule. And I thought, oh, this is cool. Two uh, former Sandpiper pilots flying together. This is going to be great. And he and I were around the same seniority. We flew together in New York. We flew together, I think, in Chicago, too. Um, and in L.A. Flew together in L.A. back in the day. And uh, so I see him. I'm like, hey, what's going on? His name's Max. You know, like, hey, Max, what's going on? And he's like, oh, not much, man. And, you know, I was like, yeah. I was like, what have you been up to the past couple of years? You know, he's like, well, you know, I got married. Got an 18-month-old at home. And I got another one on the way. And my wife's a flight attendant and she's been on med uh, maternity leave. Uh, so it's been really nice and, you know, got a nice house and all this stuff. And so we got to catch up and then I was like, well, so are you with two babies on the way? Are you probably going to stay in the right seat for a little while? Or think maybe you go to wide body FO or what's your plan? He's like, oh, I'm not going anywhere. He goes, I'm going to sit in the right seat. I have, you know, a senior FO. I get great schedules. Uh, he goes, I only do the transcon stuff. Why, why should I bother, you know, doing all this other stuff? And uh, he goes, plus I make more money than you. And I went, oh, that's right. What? He's like, yeah, you upgraded and you're making this much an hour. You probably bring home this much. I went, yeah, that's pretty close. He's like, yeah, I brought home this much last year. And I went, wait, what? How, how are you making more money than me? He goes like, well, I'm a senior FO. So I drop trips to my friends. And then I play the M Max game, 
and I go and pick up trips that have two deadheads in it with one leg, live leg, and and then I'll go back, and then I'll have my friend drop me back the trip, which then will make me illegal for this other trip, and then they'll take me off that trip, and then I'll drop another trip to another friend, and then I'll... And he's explaining this complicated, myriad way of using all the rules in the contract to benefit him to the point where he says he gets about three months paid off a month because he goes over the thousand hours and revolving 12-month calendar cycle. And because of what he's picking up is over-guarantee or overtime, paid a time and a half. Sometimes he does the game through the vacation and all that stuff. So he's getting paid for deadheads and days and he makes sure that the it lands after 1230 at night or something. So you get an extra so many hours of pay and he knows all the rules. And he's making more than captains as an FO by playing the game. And I thought, hey, great. If you're not breaking any rules, you're staying within the, the, the guise of the contract, play the game if you so desire. For myself, that's just way too much work. I'm exhausted. Just, I was exhausted just listening to how his strategy was playing out. I thought it was genius. I thought the fact that he could know all these rules and regulations and manipulate the system to his benefit, as long as he's not doing something that's breaking the contract or hurting another person fellow employee, another pilot, by stealing trips or stuff like that. No, he's not doing any of that. Everything he's doing is legitimate. Everything he's doing is within the contract. And I thought, well, if there's a pinhole in the dam, the water will escape, and every single drop of water will know that that pinhole is there and go through. Same with pilots. If they know the the contract and they know how to manipulate it in their favor and they tell a friend and that friend tells 10 friends and then until 10 next thing you know every pilot in the system knows how to do it whether or not they decide to do it it's up to them for me it's exhausting i i, I enjoy my time at home i love being a line holder because i know when i have to be up to work and what time i'll be done yes keith occasionally i get these day turns and i show up just with my kit bag and i think well if I, uh, if I get stuck there, I'll, I'm sure there's a Walmart somewhere I can buy some BBDs or Fruit of the Loom. Or, but I, I, try not, I try to always bring a, a rollerboard bag simply because I did a turn into Dallas last month and uh, all I had was my kit bag. And of course, I had to go from like D gates to A gates and I walked it and my kit bag is not the 40 pounds it used to be, but... When you put a <laughs> laptop in there and some chargers, it gets pretty heavy and I'm switching arms and my FO's looking at me like, so you didn't bring your rollerboard, huh? <laughs> I went, okay, 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 I'll bring my rollerboard. I'll bring it empty, but I don't care. Um, so yeah, uh, there are those that manipulate the system on the 121 world because we have this contract, this veil of protection. And unfortunately, no. that just does not work in a 135 part 91 operation. You cannot have that attitude. That's another part of that stigma where it comes from. Don't manipulate your boss when your boss is a private owner. When it's a corporation and no one's noticing because the contract is there to protect you, okay. But when you're dealing with a small operation where it's a private owner, you try pulling that shit, yeah, you're gone. Well, I mean, I can understand, you know, from the 121 aspect, like what you're, you know, what you said that that guy's doing, because I'm basically living that life right now. Like I hit my 950 hours not too long ago to be upgrade eligible here at Sandpiper. And I don't want to upgrade right now. Like I'm, I'm getting the exact trips I want. I, I, we just bids just closed and I got my number one choice aligned that credits me like 92 hours next month. Like, yeah, I know I, I, you know, I have, I, I just got done doing some trip trades before I came up uh, from the, the lobby and like, I'm getting the exact thing. Like what's what I'm not saying that what's the incentive, but like, what's the rush right now? I mean, I, I, I can upgrade and I do want to upgrade, but when I can live a, a quality of life, that's really great, especially for a regional and get paid captain's pay, which is what I'm getting. Like what right now is the incentive to me to upgrade, you know, at the, till the end of the year or till when a good uh, bid vacancy opens in Dallas. Right. Or at least until you can hold the line as a captain and then you upgrade then and that way well, your quality of life remains high. 
Well, and that, and that's 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 what it is. It's like right now, even as it stands in Dallas, with all the the direct entry captains as we've we've hired, I would hold a line. I'd be uh, like number in the mid two hundreds to low three hundreds in base in Dallas, which wouldn't be terrible, but I wouldn't get you know quality lines that I want. Like right now, I'm in the top five percent in base, and like I'm getting like I said, I got my number one choice of lines. Right. Like I, I work Monday through Thursday. Yeah. I have weekends off. Well, that's like, a, you raise what? another good point because you know at an airline, as a even if you get a crappy line, we have what's called trip trading, where you go into the computer, it's an app, and you go in there and you go, okay, I, this is my trip. Uh, are there any trips that I can legally trade for that the company needs covered more than this trip? And if the answer is yes, which I just finished a trade this morning at eight a.m then you can trade your trip for another trip that might work for your schedule or your appointments or whatever you have going on at home in your benefit. And you can still get paid. You still are doing the flying. They're just, you know, just traded a trip for another trip. You can't do that on a 135 scale. You just, you just not going to happen. It's not like you can go, well, I mean, maybe Roger can correct me on this if I'm misspoking, misspeaking here, but um, for the most part, the, the operation is going to be small enough to where it's not like they need you to fly this trip. The owner needs to go from A to B. It's not like you have like 10 owners with 10 airplanes. Maybe, maybe that exists. I don't know. And you can go, well, I don't want to do that one. Can I do this one instead? It's like, no, you got to do what they need you to do. Yeah. There is no changing. I mean, and Keith will tell you the same thing. They go, I mean, he goes where they tell him. It's not like the organ, you know, instead of, you know, Omaha, the, it's going to be an Aspen. Although it sounds like Keith's flying to those mountain towns anyway. But you go where you're told. Yeah. And if, you know, your high net worth guy wants to go to place A, you're going to place A. There's no change. Unless you get to the point where I was in my previous operation. We have got four airplanes and I can kind of pick and choose which one that I want to go to. But unless you're there, you go where you're told. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, as we're progressing here uh, in the show today, and I know this is probably going to go a little longer than I want, um, but I would like to talk a little bit. I would like to talk about resume building. Um, as the listeners may know, uh, I've talked about this before. I am part of the Legacy Airlines Cadet Academy mentorship, and I have a pod of people or individuals that are going through the training program uh, to inevitably end up at our regional partner over at Sandpiper and then potentially over at Legacy Airlines. So, and they well, range. Caveat to that, the, it's one of the three now. It, oh, one, yeah, it, yeah. Sandpiper yeah. or the other two wholly owns, right. Um, so, and they, and their contract also is changing constantly and they just upped and made it even more lucrative uh, for them. Um, and Alex, it's been a long time since I had you on the show and I've been wanting to talk about, and I know you're not in recruitment anymore, uh, but I wanted oh. to talk to you a little bit about how that hiring freeze, which both Legacy and Sandpiper and all the other wholly owns have a hiring freeze right now. No one's hiring. As a matter of fact, we're going to talk, uh, if we're, there's time, we're going to talk about Spirit Airlines and what they're going through. And is that an indicator? We've talked about this shows ago on the show entitled, Has the Music Stopped? Um, and yes, it's a cyclical nature of the company. And yes, I, I believe that there is there's so many articles that we could be talking about throughout the week about how there's been an overhiring and we've never had so many employees at the airlines in history. Um, another article came out just yesterday about that, um, which was posted by the way, on a Facebook page called the aviation business information board, which is run by our very own Kyle. Um, Kyle, thank you for all that information. You're constantly bombarding us with, uh, facts and articles uh, from the airline industry, and a lot of the sources for myself come from the Aviation Business Information Board on Facebook. So if you're on Facebook and you're interested, just do a search, and if you need help with an invite, let me know. But um, back to the show, we, we're talking about hiring and the lack of. And on with one of my cadets recently, I had a long conversation. He sent me his resume and he said, Hey, I'm a CFI double AMEI now. I'm start, I got a job at the flight school that I was instructed at. I'm now an instructor. I'm going to get my first student next week. I know I still have a long way to go before I have my 1500 hours or whatever program he's in. I don't think he needs 1500 hours. I think he only needs a thousand, but, um, but I want to get this resume you know, looking good before I submit it anywhere. Can you take a look? So I took a look and it, it was a good resume. 
but I, again, and I've talked about this on the show many times, it's the bullet points that matter. It's the, all the little things down there. Um, one page CVs is what they want. Don't do front and back. One page CV. Okay. If you think there's too much on there, there's too much on there. Don't run it through chat GPT. Um, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. But there are other ways. Um, Alex was talking about um, the services that are out there. Resume prep, interview prep. Um, Alex, which, which was the service that you had gone through yourself? So I used when I got hired at Sandpiper, and I mean, I guess we can call it Skywest because I'm not there, so I don't work for them, so I don't represent them. Um, but I, I used, a, it's an online website called aviationinterviews.com. Um, and it literally has gouged questions from, you know, that people remember or whatnot of what they got asked in the interview towards, you know, Jeff charts or, um, you know, the, the tell me a time wins and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and it was fantastic because it was literally almost verbatim to, to what, you know, what I experienced in the interview. So at least gave, you know, somewhat of an idea of like, you know, how to, to, to answer them. Now there are services out there that you can pay for that will scrub your logbook, scrub your resume, um, and, and give you a mock interview. That's not aviation interviews. Aviation interviews is literally just gouge paper that you read. Um, but there are companies and I, you know, I don't know exactly what they are. I, I've heard of them just by, because of working in recruitment that they will, they, you pay five, six, seven hundred dollars to to go through, and they they you'd send them your logbooks and all that, and they they go through and audit and make sure that you know all your times add up correctly, and that you know they'll they'll build a resume based around those times and all that stuff, so that you look good going into United or Spirit or Delta or American or you know Legacy Airlines or Acme Airlines, right? Like that, mm -hmm. it, it so that everything looks good, and then they will prep you for the interview they will actually give you what you an interview that you'd experience at whatever airline that you're trying to go for yeah so hopefully you walk in prepared and not thrown off by some random question that you weren't expecting which might then create a hiccup so yeah so there's plenty of uh, organizations out there that can help you the what i mentioned earlier were the bullet points and, I, and that's what i wanted to ask you alex is um for me the bullet points are the most important because in terms of your flight time that's just a meter do you meet the minimum qualifications uh having too much flight time can be just as hindrance as having too little flight time especially if you're trying to get a job at a regional and they're like well you have twenty thousand hours why are you why are you flying here? You're overqualified. So that could hurt you as well. Um, so, but the bullet points I think thought were most important. And in this particular individual's, I'm not going to share a name or anything like that, but in this particular individual, he, he sent me his resume. It looked really good. He had a very smart guy, a lot of great things. But then at the bottom on other professional leadership bullet points, he had one bullet point. He was an Eagle Scout. I'm like, hey, that's great, but give me something. Give me more. I need three bullet points in there minimum. I'm like, okay, you were an Eagle Scout. Give me three badges that you earned. Like, did you earn a survival badge or a business, uh, some kind of thing with business or anything, leadership badge, anything like that, that or you can put on there? Give me more. And then leave it vague. You want to leave your resume a little vague. That way, the interviewer has something to go, oh, I see you have here an Eagle Scout and you have these leadership badges. How did you earn that? You know, I... Fine. Leave it vague. Don't give them the. Don't give them your whole bio. That's not what the CV is about. And then on the other points where he had like work experience, I was like, well, you have three bullet points on these three work experiences. Can you lower them to two? That way, you just give me two. Give me the top two. That way, you have more space down here on your one page CV for the bullet points. And then uh, you got to give me more bullet points. And he, we just start talking back and forth. And he had a lot of. He was like really impressive stuff like that he didn't have anywhere in his resume like he actually is a pilot that works with the sheriff's department that you know he's volunteering his time and they works with that and then he does something else i think with firefighting and aviation and i was like well that's fantastic that's what i want that's gives me a better opening to a conversation with you than how many flight hours you have as a flight instructor i don't really mm -hmm. care so so he took my advice, and then Alex and I went back and forth. I gave him 
the aviationinterview.com website. I also gave him some non-aviation related books to kind of look at, especially as a flight instructor. Um, I've talked about the book Crucial Conversations, uh, a guide to having a conversation when the stakes are high. It's a fantastic book. Um, and he you know, took it all in and was very appreciative. Now, Alex, as a former airline recruiter, is there anything that I said that you can maybe expand, expand on? on? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So I can tell you, um, obviously, I'm still bound by NDAs at the airline, right? Like I, I signed it, and like I can't go into super oh, specifics. Yeah. But like when, when it comes to like looking at someone's resume, I mean, realistically, where we start is we start with um, airline interview or uh, uh, airline apps.com, um, which is don't get me started on it like it's a bastardized version of a way of building your resume mm -hmm. um and it you know there is there is stuff in there to show like volunteerism there is stuff in there to to show like all all the stuff that you've accomplished outside of aviation which is fantastic but i mean when we were looking for hiring and we're, i'm just going to talk fo's right because like when we have direct entry captains and whatnot like those are a little different with what we're looking at but if we're looking at fo's i mean realistically um, you know, do they meet their time requirement for their whatever ATP that they're going to go for? Are they within about a hundred hours of where they're going to go? Whether that's a thousand, seven fifty for military, thousand for the four year degree, twelve fifty for the uh, uh, two year degree, and fifteen hundred if you're just a regular Joe Schmo. Um, and from there, like we start looking at other things like check ride failures and DUIs and criminal histories. And, you know, before we even start looking at, you know, who you are and what you've got on there, those things play into it. Like that's, that's a, a big deal with, uh, you know, especially with DUIs um, at Sandpiper, I will say this, like if you had a DUI in the last 10 years, we're not hiring you period the end. Like, yeah. and I, I don't know if that's at other airlines, it's like that, but we're 10 years like flat out um so you're saying there's a chance and, 10 years yeah well I, if you have a dui please let it be over 10 years old i mean even still that's going to be tough to try to yeah. to squeeze that out you know check ride failures like we'd look if you had more than three check ride failures mm -hmm. you know like that that's a big deal too like these are all things that like you don't think is like you know like oh it's it happened a while ago or you know all this but like everything comes back to i wouldn't say haunt you but everything in your past in aviation is public record like we can search and we can pull up all your stuff within a matter of hours and get your full pilot's record yeah and a lot of that came from the the congressional ruling on the colgan crash and how mm -hmm. they were like well wait a minute the, this guy the particular pilot that was in question at the controls of that crash had multiple failures from other airlines, but yet their airline said, well, we never knew about it. So the government said, okay, enough. We need to have a centralized database for these. So yes, now, not just the driving record, but your aviation record as well is very much a matter of public record for the safety of the, the public. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's important to one, disclose all that stuff and know what these factors are. You, you mentioned DUI, but a lot of conversations lately have been with this new generation of people that everyone now, it was for a while that everyone had ADHD, everyone, all the kids, you know, you're in grade school, mm -hmm. you have ADHD. So everyone's getting, putting on medication. Oh, it's, put them on Adderall or whatever. But if you answer on your medical that you've ever taken certain medications, which includes Adderall, it's an automatic disqualifier for life when it comes to an aviation that medical. I was going to say, I believe they're starting, they've changed that or they're in process of changing that uh, with some of the mental health stuff that I, I know for sure with some of the depression medications, um, I don't know if it's for uh, first class, so don't hold that to me, but st things are starting to change where if you haven't been on that medication for like two, three years, then you can hold a medical to be able to fly an airplane. But again, I don't know, I'm not trying to speak fact of if it's yeah. for a first class or not, but I know that the, the FAA just came out with stuff like that for loosening up for, for mental health stuff. Yeah, I believe um, uh, from what I read, and it's been a while, but I believe there's a special issuance that can can happen, but you have to go through some pretty in-depth evaluation. I believe yep. that process is a 12-month process. So it's not a, but on not a total disqualifier anymore, 
for certain aspects of it, but there are just more hoops that you're going to have to jump through. Mm -hmm. In in light of the recent history in the past 10 years on airlines, not in the U.S., with the exception of we did a story about flying high and taking mushrooms and sitting in a cockpit jump seat, Um, but uh, there are other issues around the world with pilots that had mental health issues at the controls Mm -hmm. and turned out to be disastrous and so the FAA is trying to prevent that from happening so the first thing they do is they drop the hammer and they go no anybody that's disqualified you're done and then as time goes on and we get the knowledge and you know more research uh, accomplished then they start to loosen those regulations and I believe that Alex that's what you're talking about is now they're starting to look at giving special issuances for people that have had previous disqualifiers but that's something like when, when we look at somebody for, for uh, candidacy, right. For, for Sandpiper, we would look at, you know, their, their, their resume, if you want to call it that on, on aviation or airline apps.com. And the only thing on there that really says is, do you have a valid first class medical? That we don't go into any more than that. That's, that's a conversation that you need to have between you and your AME mm. at, at that point. And that's something that you work on. Like we're, all we care about at the airlines is do you have a first class medical and isn't it going to expire within 90 days of you starting training? So if it's going to expire, then we need you to get a new one. But uh, realistically, like that's all, that's all we care about is this valid. And are you, are you legal to fly? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, but that, 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 that it, it is very good uh, topic to bring up because I mean, that's something outside of this that like, if you're a, you know, young kid looking to fly and you've been on Adderall, like go talk to an AME. And we we have been recommending this for years now. Um, if you're interested in flying, you just happen to stumble across this podcast going, oh, I want a podcast about aviation. And you're like, wow, this is great stuff. And you're like, yeah, I'm going to go and get my private pilot license. And they're like, well, all you need is a student pilot certificate with a third class medical. If you're only going to take it to a private or an instrument GA certificate, great. Cool. But if you have intention, even the slightest inkling that you might take it further to a commercial or a corporate or an airline gig go in there and tell them you know what um i want a first class medical or talk to your ame and say hey i want to just make sure that i'll pass a first class medical uh, right now i'm getting a student pilot with a third class but i want to make sure i pass a first class medical because if there's something that you didn't know or didn't think of that's an automatic disqualifier that's going to change your decision on your career pro- projection, you know, or your career path. So have the knowledge before you start putting thousands of dollars in aviation training into the mix. It's always a good idea. It's it's funny that you mentioned that because I the I flew with a flight attendant recently and she was wanting to to move from you know the back to the front and uh, she had said that she's not sure how it's going to work because she was diagnosed, I want to say she was in her like mid-20s, but she was diagnosed at like 16, 17 with epilepsy, Mm -hmm. but she hadn't had a seizure in like four years. Right. And and I told her, I said, look, I know you want to move over here, and I know this could be a fantastic career for you, and it's fun, but before you get down that road, exactly what Tony said is go talk to an AME, like Google AME, uh, aviation medical examiner near me, near your hometown. I forget where she lived, but like Google that and it'll pull up somebody who's near you and go talk to them, you know, yeah. bare minimum, do a little meet and greet. You pay a hundred dollars to go see the doctor. And if he denies you, cool, you paid a hundred dollars. So you're not spending a thousand dollars, you know, thousands and thousands, thousands of dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, now, Keith, when you when you transition from the 121 retired, and then you're like, "Hey, I'm looking for work in the 135." Obviously, you were working on your resume, and you were you were passing those out, right? Uh, were these kind of the considerations that you were looking at, or because of your extensive three decade experience plus at an airline, did you not really worry about those kind of things? Did you let the resume speak for itself, or or what was your process? Yeah, pretty much because what a lot of people do is, well, I, I, all right, you, so you got this much total time, you've got this much time in the last 90 days or six months, you know, so you want to show recent flight experience, but then they go into, well, I flew the, you know, 727, I flew this, I flew that, that, and they go into way too much detail on which airplanes they had flown in in their career 
Um, you know, if you've flown 30 different single engine planes, you know, that's great too. All you have to do is list that you, you know, have a single engine license or whatever. But I think uh, what you've been talking about is, is really critical. It's the other bullet points. What else have you done? What organizations are you in? What volunteering do you do? Um, all of these things uh, tell whoever's looking at your resume more about you as a person and what you're doing. Uh, you know, all right, so we have a band. Well, that's interesting. That's a conversation starter. Uh, you have a podcast. Well, that's a conversation starter. Uh, it, what things can grab somebody's attention that you can say, oh, yeah, this is interesting that I've done, or this is interesting I've done. Um, they don't really care what you did last summer necessarily, but what do you do on an ongoing basis? Or what did you do for, you know, I, I was in civil air patrol for 20 years. Um, I'm not in it currently, but I can talk about it. And that's an interesting um, aspect of things that I've done before. So the more things you can put in there that are interesting, that gets you in the door, or at least gets you read and you'll get a phone call. And I see Alex is nodding his head, so uh, maybe well, I'm on the right no, track with all that. No, you, you're you're 100 right. Is like you know if you're looking at you've got like let's say we got five different candidates in front of me, right? And I'm going back to my recruiting mindset, and I've literally got five applications open in front of me. Everybody's got. 1500 hours, 50 hours of multi-time, like basically they meet all the wickets that we need to for, you know, meeting for the, the ATP minimums, right? Everybody's got the same hours are hours. Anybody can get hours. Uh, what Keith and Tony are both saying is what sets you apart at this point? What have you done? Are you volunteering, you know, at women in aviation? You can volunteer a, as a man working events with people at women in aviation. Are you, are you a part of, uh, you know, uh, some type of pilots group, whether that's uh, Papa or uh, God, uh, LPA, OBAP, uh, NGPA, the, you know, the, the list of acronym uh, based aviation groups are, are f uh, phenomenal. Like they're out there and they're designed to help pilots, you know, move on to that next step. You know, I know our tags probably one of the biggest one and it started out initially being for military. And at this point it's really turned into, you know, like one of the best pilot groups that's a non non race, non sexual orientation, whatever. It's literally just basically a giant pilots group that helps pilots get hired anywhere. Yeah. And Keith so, was pointing over your, your, uh, Got some R tag experience there, as does Terry. Uh, I was used uh, the rotor transition, uh, rotor. What is Terry's it? literally wearing the shirt. Oh, yeah, look at that R tag. <laughs> yeah, rotor transition but, airline group, something like that. Um, yeah, yeah so it, 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 there's so many organizations out there, and you know, you don't have to go and like do some major like 100 hours a month of right. No, just go go to a go to a show, go to a trade, go to a an organization event, and go sign up, volunteer, get on an email list, uh, pay some dues, pay like a membership fee. Just, well, it's just, get I was just going to say there. NGPA has a, uh, if you're not a gay pilot, NGPA has a ally that you can pay the $50 or whatever. Hey, are you one too? You're pointing at it, Keith. <laughs> like, no, I'm just saying hey. I, my time's up. I need to get going. Oh, you gotta oh. get going. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, well, well then let's let's just say this. Keith, thank you so much uh for joining us today. We do appreciate you spending some time with us. I'm very thankful for your friendship and your time. Um, you know, as we mentioned, your journey continues and I look forward to hearing more about your post retirement flying, you're the flying bug and all the other bullet points that you have on your CV, all the other things that we mentioned in your introduction are just so exciting. Is there anything that you can uh, plug today for yourself and for your wife and for your, uh, your other businesses? Um, I guess the, the, the most recent thing is uh, our involvement with uh, Eduvators, which is uh, uh, consulting for AI for educators. So if, if there's uh, educators out there uh, teachers, administrators uh, that are afraid of AI, uh, look up Educators uh, website, YouTube, podcast, and uh, get up to speed on on the benefits of AI. That's uh, uh, 
something that's a great tool for educators to use and something to not be afraid of. Uh, people are making rules against uh, using AI in their in their institutions, and they don't know why they're doing that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, um, that's kind of a, a focus at the moment, and it's uh, been a lot of fun. And I'm learning a lot about it myself, so it, it's it's a great thing. Yeah, and, and congratulations. Uh, we were talking about how you hadn't released a new podcast in a long time, and then this year you had a new podcast episode. I enjoyed that episode. It was really cool. Yeah, you guys inspire me to to get the microphone out and and put something out there. So hopefully make some more. And I mentioned uh, I'm in the process of uh, starting an aviation podcast. I, I don't want to. Um, we release any details about that right now, but when the time is right, uh, I'll be letting everybody know. Yes, and I will definitely uh, shamelessly plug your podcast as soon as you're ready to release that too. I'm very excited to hear about that. And your band, you know, you've been performing quite regularly. When's your next show? Is there a place that maybe a local listener can go listen? Or do you have anything uh, lined up? Nothing really public. Uh, we we do a, a couple of. Uh, uh, religious institutions uh, each month. So, um, although we did the uh, 4th of July parade here this year, I, I think I tried to talk you, Tony, into coming down to watch that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had a scheduling conflict, but yeah. uh, we do uh, the 4th of July parade each year. Mm -hmm. And that's been, uh, I don't know, I've been doing that like 20 years now. So oh, wow. that, that's always been a, a fun that's, thing to uh, do. That's the Huntington Beach uh, 4th of July parade, correct? Yes. Yep. And also don't forget, we have our big air show coming up uh, in October that we have every year. And I think we're having Blue Angels this year. So, you know, I think I, I, I purchased equipment years ago to do the remote. Right. So I got this uh, the microphone with the, the, the MP3 recorder that plugs right into the microphone so I can sit out there. And I even have the uh, like the news boxes to put on your microphone live from <laughs> the Blue Angels uh, air show, whatever. Um, so I, I think you and I need to get together and maybe in October we can. Uh, plan a recording live for a live show. spot live spot yeah that'd be fun um well good well thank you again uh for joining Running us from the right yes <laughs> <laughs> thanks again for joining us it's always a pleasure and i'm sure we'll talk to you very soon well thanks again for having me tony and and everyone uh great to be with you and uh we'll check in from time to time and see when we can uh, drop in again absolutely thanks keith bye, -bye. Keith, take care Take care, Keith. Thank you, Keith. So we've been talking about resume building, um, disqualifiers for FA medicals, how to you know make sure that you are on the right path, uh, having all your check boxes checked correctly, so that you don't have any surprises down the road in aviation. Now, a couple more articles, and then we're going to wrap it up today. Um, one. I've found it very interesting, uh, and we've all had a, these kind of conversations in our past, how aircraft have not ever really been susceptible, unlike the movies may lead you to believe, to be hacked. Because they're, although they're not necessarily a closed system, there's no like port. You can't like just plug in to a USB port in the back of your seat in 24F and then hack into the the flight controls and control the airplane from the back seat. I forget which movie that was, but I mean, it's just not, there's no correlation there. There's no way to do that, at least to our knowledge, right? But the FAA seems to think a little differently. In a new proposed regulation from the FAA, from Aerotime News or Aerotime.Aero, uh, an article came out August 22nd from Goda. Um, and I'm sorry about this last name, Labanuskaiti, I think. Uh, really quick read. Uh, the FAA has introduced new cybersecurity regulations for newly built aircraft to protect aircraft manufacturers against potential cyber threats. The new Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, or NPRN, was proposed by the FAA on August 21st, 2024, and aims to revise existing regulations as well as adding new ones. The FAA's goal is to simply... An to simplify and speed up the new aircraft certification process while maintaining the same level of safety provided by current conditions. The proposed new regulations are designed to protect the equipment, systems, and networks of airplanes, engines, and propellers against intentionally unauthorized electronic 
interactions or IUEIs. We love acronyms in aviation, don't we? Uh, or so-called cyber threats. The FAA said that the intended effect of the action is to reduce the cost and timely and time necessary to certify new and change products and harmonize, I love that word, FAA regulation requirements with other civil aviation authorities. Under the proposed regulations, multi-engine aircraft with more than 19 passenger seats or a maximum takeoff weight of over 19,000 pounds will be required to conduct a cybersecurity risk evaluation. The FAA said it would expect such analysis to assess the severity of the effect of threat conditions on associated assets, systems, architecture, etc. Consistent with the means of compliance the applicant has been using to meet the FAA's special conditions on this topic. So basically what this article is saying is the FAA has very recently, days now, a couple days ago, has released this um, rulemaking that they're going to propose that new cyber threat or cybersecurity threats be imposed on all new aircraft. Now, we always said that the movies are the movies. They make it dramatic, but really there's no way because it's like a closed system. But really it's not because the aircraft, especially if you fly an Airbus or even Boeing, is constantly talking to the manufacturer. It's constantly talking to the engine manufacturer. It's constantly talking to the company. We have what's called uh, the FOQA program or flight, what is it? Flight uh, Operations Quality Assurance, I believe is, the, is what it stands for. Um, so if, if you, um, let's say you high speed a flap. So you call for flaps three knots above the maximum flap extension speed for that flap setting. And the airplane goes to that flap setting and it goes, ding, you know, you just... Flap speed exceedance, okay? Now you're like, ah, who's going to know? It was only there for a second. We had to get down. We, had to, we needed more drag. We, it's only for a second. Nothing, nothing's going to happen for a knot. Before you get to the gate, your phone's going to be ringing from the FOQA gatekeeper. And they're going to say, hey, uh, we just saw that you had a flap over speed condition. You're like, what? How did you know? The plane is constantly talking through their air, ACAR system or through their SATCOM system or a CPDLC. So you, you can't get away with cheating a little, right? Not in the aircraft because it's constantly co contacting the manufacturers. Engine parameters are constantly being monitored by the engine manufacturer during live, real time. So with that said, regardless of encryption and security protocols, it opens the door to a risk. So this is what the FAA is doing. It is updating its current regulations to keep up with the increased threat uh, to prevent, actually, according to the article and a quote from the FAA, to prevent inside or outside the aircraft, uh, prevent malicious modifications to aircraft equipment systems and networks. So this is interesting. This will help streamline the manufacturing process. I'm sure Boeing is happy with that. And it'll add a layer of security to our computer systems. Now, how many uh, computers are on the Airbus? As the Airbus uh, typed person here, I should know this, but hundreds, hundreds of computers constantly acting, talking to each other in just in the airplane. And that's not to mention all the data that's being transmitted out at any given time. Now, Terry, on the 7576, you guys also have real-time engine monitoring parameters, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Real-time engine monitoring, Boqua, we've got all that stuff. And then, you know, the same as you guys, you know, ACAR, CPDLC, all of that stuff. So, yeah, it's, uh, I, 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 I would say not, not having read the uh, NPRM, but, uh, you know, just, just based off of what you're saying, I, I think it's a good thing. I think, uh, you know, more and more, uh, more and more businesses, entities, organizations, whatever, they're, they're, they're getting hacked every day. I mean, I, I get breach alerts every day about, you know, places where I've, I've created a username and password and, and they've been hacked and, uh, you know, right. it's, it's just, it, it's, it's only going to get worse. So yeah, the, the fact that the, uh, the FAA is trying to 
I don't, I, I don't want to say get in front of it, but you know, at least do something about it. Um, I, I think that's encouraging. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, last topic we're going to briefly talk about here um, is something that has had every aviator I know keep kind of a close eye on. We were speaking a year ago about how this has been the most lucrative time in aviation for airline pilots, corporate pilots, GA pilots, student pilots, because the career progression, the salaries, everything was just like the highest it had ever been. And we have been warning pilots and listeners that the aviation industry is, by definition, a very cyclical industry. And for however high it goes up, it'll come down. We talked about this during COVID, how during the pandemic, we had a shutdown, nobody left their house for months. And then all of a sudden, once all the restrictions were lifted, we had revenge flying and the rubber band effect and people were flying more so than ever. As a matter of fact, part of the issue is a lot of the major airlines in the United States, at least, have had highest number of passengers seat sales in history. They've sold more tickets than they ever have in history when you look at the numbers combined in the U.S. market. However, in 2024, quarter one and quarter two, and now coming up on quarter three, they've been showing major losses in profits. How do you sell more tickets than you've ever sold in history and yet still come out in the red? And we had Max Friend on a couple of shows ago talking about fourth quarter earnings for United. That just happened to be the public record that we found. Um, then we were talking about it. And he was discussing how contract negotiations, new contracts, new pilot salaries, new flight attendant salaries, new, new the expenditure on equipment, more equipment, more everything's more expensive, right? So it costs more to do business. And if you don't raise your ticket, prices to be equally as increasing as your expenses, you're going to be in the red. And that's exactly what has happened. Now, the Boeing debacle, the fact that these aircraft orders were not coming out on time and all these companies that were hiring like crazy, anticipating those aircrafts were going to come in and get on the line. And then when they didn't, they had too many pilots and they couldn't sell tickets for airplanes that didn't exist. And that's the direction, at least, that the executives over at the airlines are pushing. They're saying, well, eh, because of the Boeing uh, aircraft order issue, eh, but what's Spirit's excuse? They don't have Boeing. They only have Airbus. So they, too, have been having a lot of problems, and they've been in the news. From Simple Flying Magazine or simpleflying.com, I have an article that was published on July 3rd of 2024 by Rytus Versinovskus. I <laughs> these names, I don't know. Um, Spirit Airline Pilots Union questions 200 furloughs amid executive suite raises. Now, we, we kind of hinted on this a couple shows ago, uh, but this is a little bit more in-depth on this. And I'm just going to quickly read through this and try to get... Uh, your take on this as well. Spirit Airline Pilots, represented by Spirit Airlines Master Executive Council of the Airline Pilots Association International, have questioned the airline's move to issue furlough notices to 200 pilots, while at the same time, the low-cost carrier raised the compensation of four chief executives, including its chief executive officer, or CEO. The furloughing of 200 pilots... According to the Spirit Airlines MEC, while Spirit Airlines executives received the raises, 200 pilots were given furlough notices, furlough notices, which was a plan that the airline had initially announced back in April. I believe that's when we first talked about it. Then the airline said it was reducing its network-wide capacity due to grounding of the Airbus A320neo family fleet because of Pratt & Whitley engine acceleration inspections accelerated inspections and removals as well because it had deferred new aircraft deliveries from Airbus. So they had ordered a bunch of Airbuses, but then they said, well, we don't have the money right now. We're going to have to defer. And we have to do all these inspections and our maintenance department can't do them in a timely manner. So they hit the brakes. 
At the time, Spirit Airlines detailed that it was planning to furlough around 260 pilots, effective September 1st. The delivery deferrals and the compensation given to the Spirit Airlines by Pratt & Whitley due to the grounding of its 320neo family fleet could improve the company's liquidity by as much as $540 million. The sum was split between the aircraft delivery deferrals, which should save the Spirit Airlines up to $340 million in the next two years, with the agreement with Pratt & Whitley adding an additional $150 million to $200 million in 2024. Potentially, the compensation from the engine maker could grow further if Spirit Airlines con aircraft continue to be grounded due to the accelerated inspections and removals of the PW1100G engines in 2025. So according to CHA Aviation Data, Never heard of them, but okay, CHA Aviation Data. Uh, Spirit Airlines has 104 Airbus A320neo aircraft, namely 91 320neo and 13 321neos. Out of the 91 320neos and 18 are currently grounded, while 13 of the 321neos are currently marked active by the airline intelligence and data site. So they, they've had some groundings of airplanes because of an engine inspection. And because of that, they've halted orders, and they've sent out furlough notices to 200 pilots. But how do you, how do you explain giving bonuses, salary compensation packages to your leadership because you're doing such a good job? I don't, I don't, it's something that in this time that I've been in the airline industry, I just don't get. Um, they, they go on, I'll put a link in the show notes for the article. They go on, they discuss the actual people that got the raises and they're quite significant. So what happens if you're a spirit pilot? What happens if you get a furlough notice? You know, what, what, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? Right now, hiring is stopped almost everywhere. You're not going to go cargo. FedEx stopped hiring. UPS stopped hiring. What are you going to do? Does this, what does can't this mean? Even, you can't even go to the regionals. Regionals oh. have stopped hiring. Right. But what does this mean to the CFIs that are out there thinking, well, you know, when I get hired, I'm going to go. Maybe Spirit Airlines pilots, if they're getting furloughed, they need to, they need to pay the bills. They're qualified. Maybe they're going to go to whatever regional might start hiring or is still hiring. So that means what happens to those CFIs that are sitting there getting their 1,500 hours thinking, well, as soon as the regionals start hiring again, I'm gone. I'll, I'll get a job on an airline. But now the market is saturated with qualified applicants that are more qualified than you. They got Airbus type ratings. So what's going to happen? We don't know. But obviously, this is not just going to affect spirit. It's going to affect really everyone. Now, quick, before we get to Alex on this, Roger, you have been out of the airline game for a while, but this indirectly is some experience that you've had. You've lived through company furloughs, uh, callbacks, and even a company that disappeared. It's no longer in existence. How did, how did all that, when you went through it all those years ago, affect you? And do you feel that this is kind of a turning point where it's happening again? I would say no. I don't think that it's happening again. I think there's a couple of things that I, I guess to start that off with is that I have been out of the airlines for quite a while now, number one. And number two, I, I, I live in, a, I now live in a different world and I don't follow it as closely and I'm, I guess, somewhat insulated from it. Mm -hmm. I did not realize that everyone had stopped hiring completely. I did. I mean, is that actually true? Is there like nobody hiring? I know it's slowed down. I know the legacy family of stuff has, has stopped. Um, legacy airlines isn't doing classes until the basically 2025. And I think uh, Sandpiper and the other two regionals have basically followed suit because we have the flow agreement with them and, well, if we're not if we're not moving people up because mainline's not hiring people, they have no slots to fill. But I think no that that's then that's kind of you know a little bit of the answer that your your question is that you you know do I think it's happening again? The answer is no because when it happened for me, I mean the whole world had kind of fallen apart for lack of better terms, and there was like it was it, it wasn't just a 
I mean, there were furloughs across regional airlines, across legacy airlines. Um, I mean, when I went, bet when I got recalled two and a half years later, there was still United pilots that were still working at at, at the regional level, waiting for their their callback. And that was two and a half years later. Whereas Alex just had kind of said, is like, you know, okay, legacy airlines stopped hiring. They stopped hiring until 2025, which is only three and a half months from now. Um, and you know, that could get pushed back, but at least that there, I there's a light at the end of a very short tunnel here. This isn't a mass um furlough from even more than one airline. I think that the ultra low cost carriers are a little bit more, and by a little bit, I mean probably you know, quite a bit more um, exposed to some of the things that we have going on right now. But I think that it's a very, you know, it's unfortunate that obviously you have a much more saturated market, to use your term, and that those 200 or so pilots are getting furloughed into a market that doesn't have a lot of space for them right now. And that's unfortunate. But I think that it's a very different environment. And I, 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 hesitate to put it this way but you know i think that there is if, if you're going to get hired on at spirit there was kind of always or frontier or allegiant um a little bit more risk to those airlines from the day you walk in the door than it and than at a lot of other places as well and so you know there's always that risk reward that you're playing maybe you bypass the regional airlines and you're getting it getting that airbus type rating that's the risk that you took for the reward of going straight into an Airbus. Um, hopefully this gets resolved fairly quickly. I think that it probably will. Now, you know, my definition and, or the world's definition, I guess, of short term or short lived, is going to be very different to those 200 pilots an hour without a paycheck. Don't get me wrong. And I, you know, I've lived it. Um, but from a, an overall industry standpoint, I do not think that this is a, an indicator of, of a mass ca mass casualty event, shall we say? So I think what what I'm hearing from you is that you think more this is a management debacle more than it is an indicator of. I don't. I don't even industry. know if I'd say it's a management debacle. I mean, you you brought up the 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 pay and the furlough for the executives. I mean, I think we briefly touched on this. The pay increases were not that much. Is it bad optics? Absolutely. I, I don't, I, I can't say that I understand the optics of it, but when, just because you're giving, you know, a, a few $50,000 a year raises, I mean, that's not going to, that's going to save the job of what one pilot. I mean, this is not a, you know, you know the numbers is different than the optics of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and even from a management perspective, sure, I'm sure that there's part of it, but it's just the the business model of those of those airlines is, I, as I understand it, you're running at much much more razor thin margins because you're just not charging. I mean, you're trying to charge people money in about six or seven different ways. Well, if you want to sit in an aisle seat, then you're going to charge, you know, X amount. And if you want to charge a window, you get this amount. And if you want to take a carry on, you're going to get charged. And if you want to walk on the airplane or if you want to get wheeled onto the air, I mean, there's so many different ancillary products that they're peddling. I think that, but that's, that's the way that the, is that a management debacle or that's just the way that it was built? I mean, and I guess you could argue the semantics of that, but, um, I don't know. By by definition, the low cost carriers are not a premium product, right? So so exactly. who are they catering to? They they're catering to people who probably have less discretionary income, right? Well, they're, and they're when, catering when the economy, to the volume instead of it's just right. volume, right? And when the economy starts to slow down and there's less discretionary income then those people aren't going to spend that discretionary income on travel, right? So the first people, they're going to cut back the travel. Right. Uh, and, and if you look at the airplane that I fly, there's 46 first-class seats. Premium product, shit. right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, have, I have almost as many first-class seats on my airplane as you have in your airplane. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's... Oh. it's Birds. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it, it's it, it, that what that goes to say is that it's it's a premium product that um, and, and the people who spend money on premium products 
they might money. slow down a little bit, <laughs> but yep. they have the money to s- continue to spend to travel to. Yep. Uh, I mean, I, I've carried plane loads of people to go where half the plane is going to a Taylor Swift concert overseas because it's cheaper to go see her overseas than it is to get a ticket in the States. But that, that's a completely different story. But yeah, so those are the people who are going to continue to to spend money, uh, you know, people who have more discretionary income, people who aren't who the spirits and the Southwests of the world aren't catering to. Right. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, it, it could be an indicator from what I'm hearing you say, Terry, because it's the indication of a particular onset of traveler. It's a low cost well, carrier traveler. I, the guy who, the, the one that's a hundred percent vacation traveler, Hey, $59 tickets to Vegas. Let's go party this weekend. If I don't have $59 this weekend to party, cause the economy sucks and it cost me seven dollars to buy a loaf of bread. Then yeah, maybe I'm gonna not spend the money on Vegas. But then the family that's like they're all you know uh, dual income earners, all both have careers, and they got three kids, and they want to go to Disneyland, uh, or they want to go to Washington to go see grandma, and so they're gonna buy a ticket and they're gonna go regardless because they're a little more stable in that middle class section of the economy. Um, so yes, I think. There's so like Roger said, there's so many moving parts on this. That yeah, it's, not necessarily... it's it's a big component of it. It's not that's not the only thing, but it's a it it surely is a a big component of. It. But we talked about you know the ultra low cost carrier, and I found this interesting. I have not had any opportunity to mention this in the podcast in the past, but now since we're kind of opened up this little box real quick, we're going to finish this off with Frontier and how they scrapped the ultra low cost carrier business model with customer friendly changes. And I'll throw a link in the show note. We're not going to get too far into it because of time, but um, the frontier airlines, uh, according to simple flying magazine by Alexander Mitchell, an article posted on May 18th, 2024. Thank you, Alexander Mitchell for having a name I can pronounce frontier airlines has thrown the commercial aviation world, a curveball today by scrapping several fees that have increasingly become the industry standard for ultra low cost airlines, like the Denver based carrier with a new customer-friendly attitude, many have come to wonder what Frontier's latest move will mean regarding the airline's long-term strategy. The nature of the ultra-low-cost experience is self-describing. Carriers forsake all other customer benefits in favor of offering passengers the lowest possible upfront ticket costs. Doesn't mean you walk away less because all the other add-ons are going to cost money. It can be cheaper going on American United or something. At the end of the day, these ultra-low-cost carriers, or ULCCs, as the industry denotes them, have historically served one purpose and one purpose only, offering the lowest possible fare. Frontier's decision, however, challenges this notion as it has pushed the airline beyond the traditional boundaries of where ultra-low-cost carriers typically choose to go. Offering passenger-friendly flexible flexibility is something that airlines like Southwest and JetBlue do, not ultra-low-cost players like Frontier and Spirit. In this article, we will examine how impactful Frontier's latest decision will be and what it could mean for the airline moving forward. So I'll put a link in the show notes if you want to read that whole article. But it sounds like Frontier's strategy is a little bit more forward-looking. Well, I, I mean, take a look at, at Southwest. I thought I heard that Spirit was looking at it, too, at, at changing their model of how they operate and trying to sell maybe a little bit more premium product. I know Southwest is is going to assign seating some point mm-hmm. next year. That's a huge change. And and you know they they've got a uh they've got loyal customers and they've got who have been flying Southwest for years based on, you know, hey, I can I can get on first. I can, you know, maybe go pick the seat that I want. And now they have to uh now they're going to have to be like a regular airline seats. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, they're changing the way they they do things. And uh, I thought I saw something about Spirit maybe doing something similar as far as, you know, changing the way they do things. I I, I haven't dug into it, but, yeah, you know, it, it's I, I mean, they, they they see what's happening right now and uh, they're looking for ways to to mitigate. So. Right. We'll see what happens. Yeah. So don't worry out there. If you're a pilot uh, building time, working on your hours, the nature of the beast is cyclical. We were asking who's hiring, who's not hiring. Uh, I went to, uh, while we were, you were talking there, I went to airlinepilotcentral.com. 
it was a great resource back in the day, and it still is. Still is. Fortunately, it's not updated because a lot of these figures are from back in May, and June, and July, and, and some of these figures are not accurate. But on there, there's a pop-up, and it tells you airlines that are hiring. And just to name a few, and I don't know, again, how accurate this is, but Air Wisconsin, Endeavor, GoJet, Great Lakes, Mesa, Republic, Silver Airways, and SkyWest, uh, according to the breakdown uh, of each uh, they're all hiring um, unfortunately in there it also said that envoy psa and piedmont are hiring which i know that they're not um, so it, take the information with a grain of salt but it'll at least give you an idea especially if you're wondering hey what airline should i put my applications to you can take a look how many pilots do they have how many bases do they have how many aircraft orders do they have all of it on airlinepilotcentral.com so uh, again i'll put a link in the show notes and uh, you know happy hunting well, I just want to wrap up the show today by saying a big thank you to Keith Wolzinger for joining us again today. Uh, Keith, we wish you the very best in your aviation career. You have a fantastic attitude, not just towards aviation, but just towards life. And I I need more of that. Just keep, keep it coming, buddy. Um, I have vowed years ago to surround myself with fantastic, positive-minded people, and I am truly honored that uh, you allowed me to be part of that so thank you Keith um, and again check him out check out his his uh, his companies there and his keep track uh, keep listening to the show because we're gonna check in with Keith quite a bit more here in the future I also want to say a big thank you to Roger and Alex and Terry for joining me today uh, we missed Rob Rob actually got called out on a trip so uh, we missed having him but we were gonna have him too it was gonna be a, a family reunion here uh, we also ask that you help us out by sharing this podcast online and with your friends. Be sure to subscribe or follow the Squawk Edit podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. We also love receiving listener feedback. You can send it to us uh, via email right there from our website. Uh, the website is aviatortony.com. That's Alpha, Victor, the number eight, Romeo, Tango, Oscar, November, Yankee.com. A-V-8-R-T-O-N-Y.com. Uh, there you can also see... Archive photos from the flight line, a guest book photo tab. There's a pilot shop where you can pick up a mug or a hat or a t-shirt or something. Um, you can also help us out by contributing back, value for value. Give us uh, a couple bucks to, to help keep this podcast running. And right there on the homepage, there's a place where you can uh, PayPal uh, a one-time or recurring donation that every penny helps keep uh, this podcast going with all the, the website and the... Uh, you know, host fees and things that I have to pay, it does help out. Um, also, if you're on Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, you can follow us under the Squawk Ident podcast. Just want to wrap it up by saying thank you to all of you for taking the time to listen to these grateful aviators. Keep the dirty side down out there. Stay safe and take care of each other. Bye, y'all. See ya. No. <gasps> Where is he? Can you land? I can't tell. You can tell me.
I'm a doctor. Oh, I mean, I'm just not sure. Do you know anything about planes? Can you fly this plane and land it? It's an entirely different kind of flying. 